Hey, think we're live. Gonna talk some JavaScript in one second. Once I figure out why I cannot go live on one of these platforms. Welcome anybody who is watching. Oh, people watching on X. Hey, we're gonna talk some code in like one second here, but I'm trying to figure out why my streaming is having issues. We're gonna talk some JavaScript performance. If you're in, yo, what's up? Hello. <laughs> hey everybody. I wanna to talk to you about why classes um, have some interesting trade-offs compared to separating your data and functions. But I am also struggling. I am trying to just figure out how to hit how to go live. Oh, here we go. One second. Then we're gonna jump into the fun stuff. I am doing something crazy where I am streaming to every place in the world at once. And it looks like X is where the majority of people are. So it's exciting. Okay, so let's go back over here. Um, hit me up in the chat if you got any questions you want me to answer. I am here. Um, Awesome. <laughs> Jake on YouTube says, props for going live in general. Every time I demo anything, it breaks. Yes, everything breaks all the time. The craziest thing about streaming live is you hit the go live button and you pray and I'm using a whole different set of tools. I'm using a whole different computer too. I'm using a PC that I just had to pick up because the only way to stream to TikTok where it's like half of my followers on TikTok. So I wanted to include that. Anyway, I want to talk to you about something I think is really interesting, which is when using classes in TypeScript, now actually, uh, first a question, how many of you use classes in TypeScript? The reason I ask is because they've been falling out of fashion as of late, right? React moving away from classes, um, Angular still using classes, many other frameworks views felt said are not using at all, and yeah, Nicholas, I'm using OBS. Um, but unfortunately, OBS supports everything but TikTok. TikTok has their own really kind of crappy application you have to use that's Windows only. Um, it sounds like we're getting bad video quality on, on X. Anybody using X, are you getting bad video quality right now? Anyway, I'll keep going. I know my head looks massive the way I have this layout, but um, if you're thinking about, I mean, let's talk TypeScript right now. If you're thinking about sort of how you want to structure your code, and we're not talking specifically like UI, UX, we're talking about code in general, um, yeah, here we go. Some people like Devin are saying, I just don't use classes at all. People might in general, but let's say you are just creating data, right? So the data could be pumped into a React component or something like that, or the data could be just something else entirely, right? It could be part of a backend API. You know, sometimes you just want to group data. For instance, I have this person class with a first name, last name, and a way to get the full name, right? This is common. You're going to have to do this in general. Uh, you could say a conventional ES6 TypeScript way to do this would be to use classes. So again, this is not for our components or anything like that. This is just for the data we have in our application. I'll, I'll zoom in to make this a little bit larger. Ah, oh, it's cutting it off. Let me know if anyone's having trouble seeing the text. Just uh, let me know and we'll fix that up. So I want to talk to you about, you may, um, nah, so I was asking about data attributes for holding state. We can get back to that. And by the way, as a side note, if any of you have questions at all, please go ahead and just throw them at me because, um, I'm ha I want to stay focused on what people find interesting. So anything that you find interesting and you want to see, please just let me know. But okay, let's talk about the performance trade-offs of classes, right? So I'm not even going to go into the performance of doing something like, you know, let's say const person equals new person, as opposed to uh, the alternative, which might be to make an object on the fly, like const person equals, um, actually I'll call this person too, so we don't have any issues equals, oh, sorry, I'm new to Windows and I'm getting used to Windows keyboard shortcuts. Don't even ask why I'm using Windows today. Uh, I am because I'm a masochist. Um, so here's another way we could have expressed the same thing here, right? We could say person two and just have a plain object. The plain object can have the data and methods attached to it. And this is kind of our two ways to represent a person, right? A class that's reusable, instantiatable, and uh, subclassable or just a plain old object, either with just the data inside it or with data and functions intermixed. Now, one thing that you'll find whenever you're creating classes, I mean, honestly, I, I do have to say, I mean, you all tell me, I think that this 
looks a lot nicer than this. In fact, on the bottom side, if we want to create new people, we also should have to create some type of, say, like factory function. So to make this reusable, we maybe have to do something like this, where we're gonna say function, um, function, create person. It's really hard to live code when you also are using a new computer and a new operating system you never use, but just bear with me. Okay, cool. And then I think the keyboard shortcut to format is this, cool. Okay, so this would be like our object-oriented vert flavor. This would be arguably our more functional flavor. And here we can say const person two equals create person, right? So I do think that this looks nicer. This looks like we're using the standard correct features and not, you know, just kind of hodgepodge making things up. And actually there are, pff, I see a lot of debate around this. There's arguably performance benefits to this over this. Um, this has to do with like monomorphism and the fact that the VM can optimize and understand um, that we are reusing this, this class, this shape, and we're creating the same shape over and over. In this case, the VMs may not be aware the same way here when we instantiate. Um, but <laughs> you're right. I mean, arrow syntax won't uh, reduce the indent level, but it certainly will in reduce uh, we'll have something a little bit simpler here. Oh my goodness, sorry. I am still learning the keyboard shortcuts of Windows and it's driving me crazy. Oh my goodness, that's not what I wanted either. Okay, sorry, we're here, we're back, we're going, we're good. <laughs> okay, so we could write it that way too. Um, not changing the index level here. Oh, I see, the indent level could be changed by removing this, that is true. We could actually have this. Now I'm probably gonna want one, annoying pain point um, about arrow functions in general is the fact that you can have something like this. This is nice. We just lost an indent level, except as soon as we want to start taking some arguments and adding a little bit of logic before we return the object, ugh, we have to go and we have to undo all that and redo. So I actually like to use this format just because I know at some point I'm going to want to add some code here. And I don't want to have to do a big refactor sesh just to do that. I, I find it annoying. Um, thanks for the smiles, Julio. <laughs> I love the cheerfulness. Oops. And I'm, I'm breaking stuff as I'm talking. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about the problems with classes here. And I really don't like this approach either. There's a different approach than both of these that I really like these days. That is really helpful for performance, reusability, serialization and deserialization, um, as well as tree shaking. So the huge issue with both of these approaches is really tree shaking. So when it comes to a uh, more traditionally compiled language, um, yeah, Sammy's throwing up at, at classes. Yes, I'll, I'll give you new reasons to throw up at classes besides what you may already know. Um, again, we know all the frameworks have moved away from classes, um, but you're not always using a framework. And again, the component itself as a class maybe doesn't make sense, but classes have nice features, subclassing this and that. But let's take a simple example. Let's say person has um, date handling. Let's say we have birthday equals, and uh, let's actually give my actual birthday. So if anybody wants to know my birthday, I assume this is year month day. So that's 24, um, 24, three. Okay. That's our birthday. Is that March 24th, 1990? You can calculate my age from that. Maybe I'm older or younger than you thought. Um, anyway, let's say for example, we want to have some kind of manipulate the birthday. I don't know why. Well, let's just do age, yeah. But let's say for whatever reason, it's more complex and we're gonna use a library. We're gonna use a moment or something. Let's assume for a minute that this age function is expensive. Uh, oops, you're right, sorry. This would be this, 24. Um, this shows how little I use the raw date object in JavaScript, but it's not complaining, so yeah, I think we're okay. Cool. Uh, let's pretend for a second this is a really expensive function. And by and expensive, I mean that it's importing a bunch of stuff. Maybe it's importing moment.js or a lighter weight date library, but it's importing stuff, right? You would think, let's say, uh, I'm going to make some space here. You would like to think that if I write this code, say in one file, and I import in another, and I create a new person, and maybe I do console.log um, person.full name, yeah. You would like to think that if I'm importing a class, instantiating it, and using one method on it, and that's all of my application, my application no longer uh, has any other code related to person involved, you would like to think 
um, that we don't use the age function, so we're not going to pay any cost for the age function. But that's not true. Unfortunately, you know, TypeScript is a um, superset over JavaScript, but it's purely compile time. And it's not compile time in the most optimal way, in a sense, because it's very optional. It's meant to be opt-in and lightweight. And so if this were a language like Rust or C++ or Java, if we define an age function with its own imports, you know, maybe dependencies, it uses moment or something, and then we never use that, it's not actually going to include that age function and all its dependencies in my final code. But unfortunately with JavaScript, whether you use TypeScript or not, doesn't matter, this is going to come with the, um, anytime I create import person and create an instance of person, I'm going to get all of the stuff, including dependencies, every single time. And that sucks. What we want is we want tree shaking, right? Tree shaking is our beautiful way of being able to know that whatever is not used doesn't need to be bundled. And as soon as you use classes and class methods, anything as part of this class is not tree shakable. So there's a better way, a much more performant way, which what we want to do instead is we want to go, oops, I'm going to juggle my windows for a second is we want to make all of these functions independent exports, right? So let's say we want to export. This will be our better way. Uh, in fact, actually, I might put this in a new file for a second. I'm just making these scratch files in a dummy Next.js project. So let's go in here, let's make a new file, and let's do um, better.ts. Cool. And I'll close this up. And let's copy all this stuff, and let's do this a better way. The better way... Oops, these are probably global modules. Why are, why are we complaining? I'm not entirely sure why we're complaining. I think we're treating all this stuff as, oh, hate how TypeScript does this. Uh, we just need to add an export and then it'll treat these as modules. That's a really funny random TypeScript quirk. I don't know if you all knew this, but TypeScript's gonna treat your code differently based on if you use the export keyword or not. It's a random little quirk it has. So in the first case, we had all of our data and methods on the class. In the new case, I'm going to make a change here. And I'm instead going to make all the stuff that I might want to do to person not part of the person class. When it comes to data, this is pretty normal, actually. This is actually OK. You're never going to tree shake data off of objects, if that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah, Fallon Pentagon is also saying another solution to that problem is just to say this, too. But anyway. Um, what we want to do instead is we want to export every function individually. Again, data is not costly, and in, in general, the, the structure of your data, you know, all the data needs to be there. You're not going to tree shake individual data properties, right? But using methods on classes. So you could argue, actually, that classes are fine. It's just methods on classes that are arguably a problem. Let's change the methods to all be functions. So I'm going to say export function full name, and let's see if GitHub Copilot knows what to do. Beautiful, except it shouldn't be this. The pattern I like to use, which is kind of inspired by Python, is all of these functions will take a person as the first argument. Now I'm gonna go through several steps. I'm gonna make this code better and better and better. So this is the first step of making it better and we're gonna get certain advantages each time. And at the very end of this, I'm gonna show you a pattern that I really like that we use in our Mitosis open source project that is amazing. And I don't see anybody else use it and it's freaking awesome. Um, and yes, one way, well, okay, hold on. One person said in the chat, the better way to do this is not use JavaScript. I'm going to make an argument that actually JavaScript is surprisingly fantastic. Let me give you a brief example. I'm going to take a brief tangent here. Um, uh, yes, and actually, yes, this looks a lot like a struct in C now or Rust or like a data class in uh, something like Kotlin or Scala. Um, but I want to briefly talk about why, if you make the argument, don't use JavaScript, why JavaScript is actually awesome. So JavaScript's a very easy to use language, right? It's very simple scripting language. You don't have all these um, compile time dependencies. The compilation is optional. That's actually quite nice. But let me give you a brief example. Let's take AI for a minute. Let's say you want to do some AI development. The natural thing to do is go grab Python, right? That's what we did at Builder.io. We grab Python. We will leverage and build our own AI models. And we built out all this code in Python. Python is great in terms of simplicity. Um, and yes, you can develop AI in JavaScript, and I'm going to mention why it's actually a pretty awesome uh, thing to do, um, or unexpected. It's not necessarily for everyone all the time. It doesn't have the same breadth of libraries as uh, Python does, but keep one thing in mind. All of these um, AI libraries are actually implemented in C, in most cases, right? If you want really, really good performance, 
uh, let's say you're using a TensorFlow package, a, um, what's another one we really like? There's one called um, XGBoost that's really, really good. All these different things. Um, Python has the most packages, but if you start adding code that's not just a simple call to a model in Python, let's say you need to call a model, then loop through some data and do something, Python's insanely slow. Like, looping through data in Python is so absurdly slow. The JavaScript VMs are so wildly more optimized, it's crazy. And you could say, sure, write all your stuff in Rust or C. Yeah, but that's very, very low level. Also, compared to language like Python, for example, you don't get static analysis and type checking. They have some optional features in Python 3. They're not very well used, in my opinion. And so with TypeScript, you have this amazing balance of amazing performance. You rarely will out outscale JavaScript to TypeScript, front end or back end. You can easily call libraries from C using C bindings, which means you can use all those ML libraries, call it from C, and you don't run into issues like we did, where you build with Python, and you don't have the type checkings, so you have weird typo errors, and you have performance issues that bite you later, and you have to refactor it all. And so JavaScript to TypeScript is awesome. Okay, end of tangent. So the better way to write, so as a reminder, we originally had this class, um, and we're gonna refactor this to have much better tree shaking and a whole bunch of performance and flexibility characteristics in a moment. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure our first argument is always a person. So basic convention, and then we're gonna say person dot first name and person dot last name, easy. And then, oops, and then for our other function, let's say we have this expensive date function, export function age, and we have the really expensive function. Again, we're just gonna export as part of this module any of the functions that we might want. Now the beautiful part, as you might have noticed now, is all code, as we know, grows and grows and grows over time. So one day somebody's gonna get a ticket that's like, okay, now we need uh, some other method. We need new stuff for the person. And you add it to the person class and you use it one place over here. And great, it's, it's, it's supported one feature over there, but now everybody's ingesting and downloading this code everywhere else. And these classes can get very, very, very bloated. If you go back over here, now as individual exports, we're only gonna use whatever, whatever functions we need. So let's actually make a new file here and I'm gonna call it consumer.ts. And great. And now here, we're just gonna do some imports. So let's first do the class version. We have person and in this version, oops, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Sorry, still learning how to use a Windows, a PC. I'm used to a Mac. Um, oh yeah, we're gonna capital person. I don't even know how to type. And then if I say const person equals new person and call it full name, again, we already know the problem here is even though we only accessed full name, we still downloaded all the code for age and every other method on there. In our better way, there's a couple differences. First, we're gonna create new person, great. And then here we're just gonna do one slight modification. We're gonna say full name person, great. Now, all the other methods and dependencies and all that other stuff um, will no longer be downloaded. And now we can add unlimited functions. Any new thing you want to do to person, you can add to this file, export function, really expensive person stuff. Who cares? We can do whatever we want. We don't care at all. And it costs us nothing. Only when we use it do we download it. And if we don't lose it, we don't download it. As opposed to if you add it to the class, you're getting it all the time. When we originally wrote the builder SDKs, um, we wrote them as classes. And they grew and grew. And people would import one thing and they'd get everything. And it was like, why am I getting this huge payload or this huge bundle cost for just using one method? And that was just atrocious to us. And this is actually the technique uh, that Valibot uses. So let's go build it IO, Valibot. Uh, we have a blog post on this, but the image really sums it up. If you love the library Zod, which if you don't use Zod, you, you really likely should. Zod is an amazing validation library to take data that you may not trust, and you really should not trust data unless you're sure, sure, sure. So the data is coming over an API response. If it's coming over a WebSocket, it's coming out of a local storage or database. Validation is a great thing. But Zod is going to cost you, let's let's check this really quickly, bundle phobia Zod. Now, every one kilobyte doesn't matter, but these things do add up. So, okay, we're going to go to Zod and we're going to see Zod is 13.2 kilobytes at the smallest, right? Minify, gzipped, etc. That may not sound like a lot, but these things can add up. And depending on your use case, that can be wasteful. Valibot, as an alternative, uses this approach I'm talking about, where instead of 
having essentially all the functions bundled in. Instead, each function is an individual export. And instead of over 13 kilobytes, just for the most basic use case, you could be doing validation in less than a kilobyte. That can be a huge difference depending on your application and requirements. And so that's something to really kind of have in mind and know is really, really valuable. So, but we're going to build on this though. We're not just starting there. And this is not just, you know, a technique we're making up here. It is a commonly used one. Now there's more problems with this. Let's talk about the next thing, which is I actually don't want to use a class anymore at all. The main reason why is, um, you know, classes are cool and they have cool features, right? We can extend, so we can say export class. Uh, here's a basic example, actually. Let's say in your application, you need to add another piece of data that you have for people, right? Let's say you don't want to store birthday, you want to store age or something. You could subclass this. You can go export class my person extends person. And then we could say, you know, let's say this was, we're always going to take an age and I think my age is 33. Now, this is a bad example because um, we, uh, in this case, don't want to track birthday and age, but you get the idea. Classes have some of these nice um, properties. So again, one big downside, one thing to remember always when coding is you write some code and somebody else is going to extend your code. And you could have your own implicit um, sort of conventions where it's like, yeah, we use classes, but we only use data, not methods. Well, you bring in some new engineer and they're going to work on your code and they're not going to know that. And you could write a weird comment, which is like, you know, <laughs> you could say, Ermaga only use data here. And somebody's going to look at that and be like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know. And they're going to go in and add their age function and do whatever they want. So a really nice thing we can do instead is something I started to show, which is turn this into a factory. So let's do this. Let's say we have, let's start with a type. We have a type person and that has first name, last name, birthday. Great. And for now, I'm actually going to say birthday is um, a number. Um, so we can do the date as a number, say like the, the integer um, representation. And I'll export this. And now I'm going to say uh, export function create person. And yes, I know some people like to do arrow functions instead of uh, old school functions. When it comes to exports, who cares? Um, and yeah, Devin Valabot is great. You should check it out. Uh, the blog post, I don't know if I linked to the blog post. Blog post is builder.io slash blog slash introducing dash Valabot. You can read about or just check out the readme, of course, too. Um, the um, Fabian announced it on the builder.io blog, which is pretty cool. Uh, anyway, let's go back to VS Code. So now we have a factory function. I'm going to start talking about some of the awesome advantages to this. So now we're just using plain old objects, which actually, as we know, and yeah, now we're really looking at something that looks like a struct, right? The pure data objects. And interestingly, remember that, that example I gave before where if you have classes, people, even if you don't use methods, somebody's probably going to come in and add methods because that's just the, the way people think about classes. If you have an object like this that's just returning data, I do think in most cases, and let's, uh, let's leave out birthday for now. Let's make this our life simpler. I want to come back to the date example because there's some interesting stuff we can do with, with uh, non-primitive types like dates. Um, but let's come back to this and let's say, hey, this is uh, a plain old object with some data. Most developers won't jump into something like this and be like, ooh, I'm going to add a you know, full name function to this. Like, while you can, this is less common. And you've kind of set the precedent already that this is a plain data object. And plain data objects in JavaScript are fast as hell. Very, very, very fast. I don't know if I'm allowed to say bad words on some of these streaming platforms like TikTok. So I'll, I'll watch my language next time. Anyway. Um, so now when we consume this, we're going to, instead of having a person, we're going to import a create person function. And we'll say person equals uh, create person. Now I'm going to show you where this stuff gets exciting. So the first piece of exciting stuff with what we have that may not have looked like a big difference. Uh, again, we had the class version and I'm going to get rid of uh, a lot of this, this stuff. So we have the class and then we have and it may actually look like this better version. This better version actually has more code in it. You know, in a lot of cases, you don't want to optimize for whatever requires more code, but it's kind of nice. We actually separated the type from the constructor, you could call it. Um, we separated all our methods. So again, we got tree shaking for free, but now we get a few other things for free. One thing that's really nice is we don't have to worry about extending classes. Let's say, 
this is a reusable package, right? This is a internal or external library and other people might want to consume this. Well, for those other people, sometimes you find that maybe your class had this full name function built in or age function built in, but you realize the way you want to calculate the full name is maybe a little bit different. And so um, the thing that you would have to do is you'd have to be like, oh, okay, now we're going to create our own subclass of person if you're using classes. And let's say in this case, you know, let's say we're going back to, let's, let's create another file to talk about our bad, our anti-patterns. I'm just call this bad consumer.ts where we consume this uh, library. So here we're going to import person uh, from uh, this scratch file. This is the one I started on. And then we're going to say, oh, well, we want to calculate something differently. So we're going to subclass this. We're going to say class my person extends person. I feel like I should make a cheat sheet, like classes and all the way you do things. And I could use your help, by the way, coming up with a name. We need a name for this sort of like pure data factory pattern. I haven't finished even showing the full pattern. I'll get there. But anyway, let's say we want to change how we calculate full name, right? Maybe what we want to do is add a, um, a dash here for whatever reason. Well, now we, you know, subclassing is cool and we inherit everything else. But now in our application, we always have to be like, oh, make sure you create instances of my person, not person. Like, let's say you work at the company builder.io, let's call it builder person. And now you're going around the code being like, hey, everybody, don't use person because we want to override how full name is handled. So everybody use builder person instead of person all the time. And you're chasing it and you're code reviewing it and all this stuff. Blah, it sucks. Instead, what you can do is if you want your own full name function, just write it yourself, right? You can just say function full name. Uh, this is our own way. Cool. And you can just use that. Now, uh, I'll talk about one other advantage we get with this pattern. And so we can extend these types infinitely. Our full name function we know takes a person, so it is type safe and everything. And we can import person from here. Um, and we can extend it infinitely and we can use our functions. Um, and you can always write custom lint rules to detect, don't use that full name, this, but that seems like overkill in the vast majority of cases. Now let's talk about another advantage. Then I will talk about one disadvantage. There is a disadvantage to this approach that you need to be mindful of. Um, really only one that I kind of am, am aware of. So a really huge benefit of this approach is serialization and deserialization. So when you're writing JavaScript code, you're almost always writing front end code or like back ends, like API code which means you're frequently having to serialize and deserialize data. Meaning if this person needs to be saved to a database, saved to local storage, sent over a WebSocket, we need to convert it into usually JSON, something that can be sent over the wire without references and other fancy stuff we get in our in-memory code here. And um, also something that I find really extremely handy is the ability to take anything and just make a copy of it. Copies are really, really useful. In my opinion, when you want to strike the ideal balance between object-oriented programming and functional programming, copying things <laughs> works really, really well. If you've ever seen projects like Immer, um, I'll show you one that's popular. So if you're not familiar with Immer, Immer is very cool in that it allows you to keep states or, or you can even just say objects that kind of retain some of the best qualities of both immutable data structures and mutable data structures in, um, in the sense that um, let's see if I can show you an example. Uh, this is, I think, showing, yeah, uh, let's use their example. So in this case, um, Michelle Westrate, Westrate, who's amazing, by the way, made MobX. MobX is wildly over underrated, by the way. Um, but anyway, a simple example of here we have um, a basic array with nested objects. Here is how we would do this exhaustive copying. If we want to treat this in a functional way where we keep the old copy and the new copy, um, you know, you'd have to do all of this additional stuff. Or if you've used like Redux, you use a lot of the spread operator and hopefully you don't mess anything up and you can use object.freeze and other stuff. But in the case of Immer, what you do is you just say produce. You actually mutate the object or the state and you get a new one back and so the old one is retained this is really useful for um i'll show you a quick example if you go into builder.io which actually uh, i'm on a new computer so i won't be signed into um, but we make a drag and drop visual editor you can use for things like converting designs to code and other cool stuff like that but let me log into this i can actually show you how we use immutability and why it's so critical um, 
But the simple example is just undo redo. Anytime you have undo redo functionality, there's my email just by the way, you can email me. <laughs> um, anytime you wanna do undo and redo functionality in any type of visual editor, you need immutability, you need copies, right? You need all the past copies of states so you can reset to one, uh, a newer or older version of anything. Um, this thing, my internet's a little hokey right now. Um, <laughs> did you not see it? Hopefully you didn't see it. It doesn't really matter. I get so many random spam emails. Um, but anyway, I'll get this open in a second and I can show you a demo. But anyway, let's go back to VS Code. And um, the beautiful thing here is we don't need fancy libraries like Immer. I'm a fan of something called MobX State Tree. It's phenomenal. It adds a little bit of complexity, but it's wildly worth it if you do anything like real-time editing like we do with undo and redo and all this great stuff. Um, let me actually go to, I'll go to a different space here. Let's go to, I have a cool Zapier demo space. Let's see if this loads. I, I've been messing with this new computer and I may have been breaking stuff with Chrome extensions and whatnot. Um, there we go, cool. So let's actually go into something here. I'll, I'll show you all some stuff. And let's go to page and let's go to home page. There we go. And so here we have the Builder Visual Editor. We have essentially Zapier's homepage loaded up here. I've made some edits to it, like Hello World and stuff like that. Um, let me actually refresh this. I, I think I borked something. Maybe I hit a keyboard shortcut. Um, but as you can see, as I can visually edit stuff, maybe we'll just edit one of these things. Oops, sorry. My computer's going crazy because I keep hacking on my local version. Um, but anytime you want to be able to make edits and undo and redo, let's go in here and do it again. Cool. So I come in here. Maybe we'll come in here. Sure. We'll edit this. And which one do I want to actually click on? Let's do this one. Hello world. Wahoo. Here we're doing, we're just keeping copies like crazy. You could be fancy and keep patches, but here we're keeping copies. And that way when we hit undo, we can go back and forth, right? This is where anytime you have a visual editor or any type of system like this where you've got components and all this fancy editing, um, you need the ability to take any data and make copies of it so you can revert and roll back in time and roll forward. We need to save this data to a database and pull it out. We actually send it over WebSockets so we can do real-time editing. So I can open this in another tab and we can show, uh, maybe I'll edit it in the other tab and then we'll see the edits kind of transfer over in real time. Once this loads, I can give you a little demo of that. Okay, cool. There we go. Wahoo. So I'm going to go over here. Wahoo. Ye and ye. Right. Again, this is all possible because everything in Builder is serializable and deserializable. And I'll show you how to do that in a very simple pattern without libraries here. So with all of that rambly prelude, let's talk about this. So I've created my person. Because I did not use a class, I can copy at any time. I can say const person2 equals structured clone person. That's it. Done. Copied. Right. If we used classes, let's go back over to this scratch file really quickly. If we use classes, we wouldn't be able to just fast clone this because structured clone or JSON string by JSON parse won't clone these functions. But as long as I'm keeping just pure data in these objects and the functions separate, I could take any piece of, of state, like this person state, and just copy it. I can easily stringify it, json.stringify, to save it to a database, to send it over a fetch call, whatever. And then I could parse it. In fact, one of the fastest ways to copy things in JavaScript, you, already, you may already know, is just to straight up inline copy, or straight up inline stringify and parse. Um, because the VMs are so natively optimized for JSON string by JSON parse, this is a great way to copy. But I will say structured clone has some ad other additional advantages. And if you're not aware, this is built into all JavaScript VMs as of these days as well. Um, sorry, I'm learning the new computer. There we go. Save. So that's a really, really nice side effect. Anything that could be copied at any time. And again, I can get, and I can make uh, changes as well. In fact, I can also say person two, person two, uh, first name equals Bob, and then I can get full name of person two, and all my methods work. I have dealt with lots of really fancy and ugly serialization, deserialization systems, frameworks, wrappers, all this stuff, to try and make it so you can write something like classes, and you know, 
dehydrate it to a plain piece of JSON data and then rehydrate it to be the class. And it's terrible for performance doing it recursively. I will show you where we use this pattern like crazy. We use it in Builder, but we use um, libraries to help us, specifically MobX state tree, which is like Immer, but, but more powerful. Um, mitosis though, is where we use this exact pattern. Um, this pattern where objects are data, methods are separate, and you can clone, serialize, deserialize, manipulate like crazy, is really useful for compilers. Um, um, and so I'll show you what Mitosis does really briefly. Mitosis is a compiler. It's kind of a new style of compiler that allows you to write React style code and transpile it to views, felts, quick, all the other types of things, right? So I can change this to blue, use state, you know, John. And here you can see my view code is being updated. I can obviously update the markup and anything else I want, um, change anything. Oops and I'm hitting all the wrong keyboard shortcuts, but you get the idea. Let's see, one sec. Copy, paste, there we go. And here, it's kind of cool because we can actually use the different view APIs. So, so the composition API as opposed to the options API, we can React, Quick, all the different frameworks. We have tons of frameworks here supported. React Server Components, Swift, SolidJS, Marco, Preact, yada, 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 yada. We use this pattern like crazy, and it's really, really, really helpful, and it makes life really, really, really easy. Um, and again, it's extremely simple. To find a type for your data, to find a factory function for your data, in fact, one thing I like to do here is always take in a partial default. So we can go person is a, um, what am I thinking of? Partial, partial person, beautiful. And then we can always come in here and do person. Actually, can you spot the bug? The bug is it would be really annoying to pass a partial and have it be ignored. Let's always make sure this overrides. And that's it. Now we can override methods easier. All the functions we make are tree shakeable. Anything can be copied, serialized, deserialized, saved to database, pulled out, because the idea is your data is just data, and anything that manipulates the data is completely separate. Um, now let me go through and uh, find some of the questions I was asked. This is a good opportunity. I would love to talk more about JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, React, or front-end frameworks, or AI. So any questions you all have, please please throw it in the chat. I am watching the chat very, very closely here. Um, and I would love to answer you specific questions. I could talk about anything. Um, one question is, how is called the extension that gives you a fast type examples? I don't know. Um, I'm actually not sure, Petco, what you're asking. Maybe if you can elaborate. I did remember one thing, though, as I was reading through the chat, is what is the downside of this approach? There's one notable downside to this approach, which is, let's go, let's simplify this code really quickly. Um, and it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, as in the benefit is the downside and, and vice versa. So uh, let's go to, I think I had a file called, like, bad, bad consumer. There we go. So one huge benefit of the old way um, is when I just do person, person dot. Here I can see all of not the properties, but the methods available here. And that's really, really nice. The fact that my ID can just tell me, oh, there's an age function that applies to person is amazing. Now, funny enough, languages like Rust and C++, the way they handle their classes and traits is actually almost like a facade. You know, JavaScript's the only kind of language here that allows you to just make first class um, properties of objects that are functions. And um, the way IDs work for other languages is they kind of know what methods are available. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. Fallen Pentagon, <laughs> I think answered the question. Yes, I'm using GitHub Copilot. So when it autocompletes stuff, that's what that is. I would highly recommend using GitHub Copilot. Fantastic, works phenomenally well. I think it's only $7 a month if you do enough open source, it's free. But anyway, here person, we know it's got age, we know it's got full name, that's awesome. Now, if we go over to what I said was the better code and we go person dot, we only first name and last name. We don't know what methods are available on this. You actually are gonna have to just know that mentally. Now, if they're coming from a file, which is you know JavaScript module, and usually the file might be called like person, then you know you can just import. You can look at the imports and say, okay, we've got age and full name and a type. So that still kind of covers this. But it, I will say, uh, in my most magical ideal world, is there would be a way to define like a pseudo class in TypeScript where you actually could have tree shakeable methods, but they would kind of behave as if they were properties, or at least your IDE would know what to suggest what is available here. That's really the only downside I know of here. 
Anyway, there were some other questions earlier. Please all feel free to ask me anything. Um, I like to talk about JavaScript, AI, etc. Uh, I think we just native and go into browsers. Oh, Devin asked a good question. When will JavaScript get basic type declarations natively integrated into browsers? Um, so this was tried once. I don't know if any of you remember, what was it? It was called, what was Google's? Google was experimenting with a, a, a static types for JavaScript in the Chrome browser. Um, let's do, uh, what was it? It was called like strong script or something. Google static types for JS. What was this? Let's ask ChatGPT. Google wants, oops. Google once experimented with static types for JS built into the browser. What was that called? Not Dart. Dart is kind of that too, but there was a simpler version here. And also, by the way, I use ChatGPT for like everything these days. Um, it wasn't DS4 either. Well, I don't know if ES4 messed with this. Maybe. I swear it was called Strong Script. It was called Subic Script. Uh, ah, it never actually shipped. The idea was a lightweight TypeScript like, you know, type annotation system. And the JavaScript VM engine could use that type information to make additional optimizations. And it never landed. I, rem I remember being so disappointed when they gave up on it. And they basically said that the JavaScript VM is so good, you really don't need this, which is unfortunate. But I do know that there is an RFC. What is the RFC? What is the proposal right now for adding types to JS? There is a proposal out there um, for adding types to JavaScript. And it's similar to TypeScript, but not quite right. Yeah, TC39 proposal. Um, yeah, and it's it's not really helpful. It's not going to lead to performance optimizations. But, you know, let's see. Let's look into the proposal here. There it is, proposal type annotations. A couple of things here are a little uglier than TypeScript. But, uh, yeah, they have good justification. People really, really want this. And, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the JS doc uh, format. They're showing that it's um, some of the inspiration. Anyway, we'll see if and when this lands. It's definitely interesting. Um, Oh, and also one other comment that people had. Um, oh, what plugins or extensions am I using in ChatGPT? I'm not using any. Um, I am using GPT-4 though, because if you didn't, um, if you didn't notice, when I ask things that it, it it isn't confident, it knows the answer. It'll do a quick search on Bing. It'll do a quick web search, and then give me an answer. And it's pretty dang good. It didn't answer this question for me, but it, it's shockingly good at other things. So there's no actual uh, plugins I'm using. I'm just using plain GPT-4. Um, now let's go back to our code. Now one thing people mentioned actually for the autocomplete is we could do this import. Um, in fact, we could kind of use a little convention here and say import star as person from our better way of, of doing person. And then yeah, we can do person dot create person person dot full name. This actually is a pretty nice solution. You can always just go person dot and see what options we have here. So that's actually a really good uh, example. Oh. Mr. asked my favorite question, what other AI tools am I using? Um, oh, somebody mentioned that my audio quality is way better on X as opposed to, um, oh, Matt Pocock is actually in the TikTok comments. Hold on, I should have been paying attention much sooner. Um, so Matt, I don't know if you're still watching. So what Matt said is types as comments proposal will absolutely rock, but has some issues related to AST. I have no clue what he's talking about, but I would love to know more if Matt is still watching. He is the GOAT in terms of TypeScript. If you all don't follow Matt, I'm just going to make sure that you all see something really important right now. Matt Pocock, I think I'd say his name right, is the best person to follow for TypeScript stuff on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, etc. This person's face, follow him everywhere. Any platform you're on, follow him. And if you want to go deep, take his course. Um, but anyway... Yeah, I would love to know more of his comments on the proposal and why he thinks it's great but has AST implications. For those that don't know, AST is the abstract syntax tree. It's the way we, um, I'll show you the coolest tool for this actually. It's the way we take code and turn it into an object format that we can then manipulate to compile or transpile it. Anyone I've ever known who's worked with compilers in JavaScript is addicted to this tool. There's not a single person I know who's worked with a TypeScript compiler, Babel compiler, or anything that doesn't use astexplorer.net. This is a very fun way to click on what you want and see um, what 
the compiler represents this as and how you can work with that. Um, but anyway, I did get asked sort of my favorite AI tools besides ChatGPT. So let me go to that. And actually, um, one other question that's good here is, does this star format support tree shaking? And the beautiful answer is yes, thank goodness, it does. This is just sort of a syntax sugar here. And anything that's not directly referenced from this module will be tree shaken away. So whoo. Now, there are nuances with barrel exports. If you do barrel exports, like export star from blob, that has some issues. But anyway, the question was, what other AI tools do I use besides ChatGPT and GitHub Copilot? Those are my top two, besides one other one. This will be a shameless plug, but the other big one is, here I've got Figma, and the other big one I use like crazy is the one we built called Visual Copilot, which is a way to come in here and so let's run it. We can take any design, like I have this cool, um, you know, Zapier design, and then generate code. And what we'll do is we'll take a static design, we'll break it down to be fully responsive. We can even, coming soon, map it to your components. So the output code actually references your buttons or other components used. And then, wahoo. Now we get, uh, let me make this a little bit bigger so you all can see it. I'll zoom in here. But now we can get code. This is now fully responsive, so I can zoom out and show you that we can rip. This has now suddenly become nice and responsive from what was a totally static Figma design. Ugh, just this design's not responsive at all. But now we made it responsive with Visual Copilot, which is by Builder.io, my company. And we can export it as code, React, Quick, Views, Felt, Tailwind, Emotion, Style Components, whatever you want. It's pretty cool. So that's an AI product I use like crazy because I do not like writing basic markup. And the beautiful thing is you can also import and just publish to your live site with our API. And coming soon, we can map to your components. So if you use certain buttons, images, you know, cards, that'll map in and it'll reference your components internally. Anyway, let me go back to more and more questions. Um, what tools did you use to build this thing? Oh yeah, what tools and libraries did we use to build this thing? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about how we built this thing. Let me actually open up, how do I open up a, uh, my old tab? There we go, oops, okay. Um, back to Chrome. So what do I use to build this thing? Um, we can talk specifically, there's a couple layers here. The first layer is this visual editor. Uh, you can literally straight up drag and drop with your components in our visual editor. Um, and you can import Figma designs and you can just publish onto your site. Um, everything here, you know, again, I can edit, rearrange. It's a responsive editor. So again, I can just make changes, undo and redo. Uh, the core of this application is it's a React app. It's mostly single page application. We use something called MobX state tree. So um, MobX, so before signals were the hot thing, there was MobX. And MobX is truly just as good. It's really genuine reactivity. Um, so signals is what Ryan Carniato sort of uh, branded and um, what would I call it? You know, I remember when he was building the reactivity system for SolidJS, or SolidJS always was like a reactivity system. It didn't use the name signals for a long time. And eventually he settled on that and then everybody else adapted it. And it was really, really well done. Now, before that, and I think very complimentary to that, it's not like signals are an improvement on this. They really both work just as well, was MobX and MobX state tree, truly reactive um, sort of types um, and objects and really, really beautiful. That's a lot of the basis for this application. Uh, the undo, redo, the real time syncing, you know, we can have multiple people editing at once, it's all good. Now you might ask, how did we build the AI pieces? Um, I do have a much longer YouTube video on this, but there's a few things here. Um, the first part of the AI, I'll, I'll show you this really quickly. The first part of the AI is being able to identify images. So I can show a different design that shows this off a little bit better. Let's go to this one. There's a bajillion designs here. Also, while you're watching this, anybody um, tuning in, feel free to ask other questions in the chat. I'll just go through and answer other stuff. Even you know, once I'm done rambling about this, I'll go in to answer anything else you all, just random questions you have, I'm game for. Uh, but anyway, let's take this example. So here's a design that us web developers know when we're developing this as code, this right here, which really is made up of a lot of different vectors, this should all just be one image. Um, another example, oops, I didn't mean to grab that. Another example would be like this logo. We can actually see it's a bunch of different vectors, but really this right here should also be just one image. Oops, uh, I realized what I'm pointing at is probably off screen for most, if not all of you. I'm talking about this, this logo right here, this should be one image when it really it's made of a ton of vectors. So we have a dedicated AI model literally trained on the internet to be able to take these things that are 
vectors, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not, and say, oh, these should be squashed into an image. So our Figma plugin will go in, smash those into individual images. The next really hard part is to identify, well, where should the flex rows and columns be? And how does this become responsive? Because as we all know, the vast majority of designs um, are not responsive. They are just uh, flat. <laughs> so we have another AI model for that. Then when we break it down to here's the images, here's where the rows and columns are, then we need to turn that into code. And that's where, which I talked about before, our mitosis project comes in. If you go to, um, let's go builder.io, mitosis, GitHub, um, probably didn't need the builder part, but whatever. This is that tool that can convert uh, a JSON format, which is what our AI generates, into code of tons of different frameworks. So we can go here and we can go, hey, give me baseline view code, react code, quick code. That's how we're turning all the stuff into code for a bunch of different frameworks, Marco, et cetera. And then we actually use OpenAI, a fine-tuned uh, version of OpenAI's GPT 3.5 LLM to then enhance the quality of the output code. So I'll show you a brief example of this. Let me zoom way in. Um, let's go way bigger here. Okay, so see the code I have here? Let's actually go to something like HTML. I'll close this so it's not distracting us. Okay, so mitosis can output code like this, which is like div, 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 and the classes are bad, div four, div five, div six, blah. Uh, what we can do is use our quality code mode, and here, ah, so much better. So now we're using a header tag, uh, and we're using um, much better class names, container, image container, title, description, this is where we can take that code and make it much higher quality. And this works across, you know, frameworks. We can go to React and like, let's do like styled components. And this is where we're using an LLM. LLMs are quite expensive, but, um, oops, style JSX, I think about style components. I might've done something wrong here. Um, but anyway, y'all get the idea. Let me go back to my code and happy to answer more questions on that if y'all have them. Otherwise, let's see what other questions we've got in the chat. Uh, Oh, well, <laughs> thank you for the nice words, Ben. If you have questions about AI, uh, Ben's comment was just about how it was really helpful to learn some AI tricks from us. Uh, but I definitely appreciate the kind words there. Let's see. Um, Sammy says cat for some reason. <laughs> um, let's see. Where do all the other questions come from? Oh, yeah, someone asked on X, where do the other questions come from? So I am multi-streaming right now to a bunch of different platforms. We are streaming out to TikTok. Um, as well as YouTube and Twitter slash X um, uh, and Twitch. I don't think anybody follows my Twitch. Oh, yeah, and LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah, there's a bunch here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Just looking at other questions people have. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. I'm happy to talk about code and AI and cool stuff, how we build stuff all day. Um, Oh, here's an interesting question. How do you trace and troubleshoot the JavaScript that TS generates? Um, this, interestingly enough, is unlikely to be a problem that, um, well, I would actually be curious. This is a problem that I never really face. Um, so let's go to like TypeScript Playground. So in the case of, the question was just how do you debug the compiled JavaScript that TypeScript generates? But the beauty of TypeScript and one of the best features of it, and maybe it's you know already well known by the person asking the question, but just in case it's not clear, is that it's really not doing anything to your code hardly at all, especially if you're compiling out to like ES6 or above, like a modern JavaScript format. You can add your types, type foo equals whatever, uh, whatever string, but you could see that the actual business logic of my code, quote unquote, doesn't change. Um, now we can do a, a down level. Let's say we down level this to, uh, let's see, TS config. Where is it? Here we go. Let's say we're down leveling this to like ES3. There we go. It changed const to a var. In many cases, I don't even use, I'm very back and forth on when I use source maps or not. Generally speaking, I can debug the, the output from TypeScript just fine. Um, the biggest area you'll find uh, TypeScript changing your code significantly is if you use classes, person. Now you can see it's doing some funky stuff. Age, return, 100. Now it's looking a little bit different, but again, it's still semantically very similar. Person.prototype.age, if you're familiar with the, the older school prototypal, proto, yeah, prototypical prototypal inheritance of, of ES5 uh, and before. 
Um, but again, if you're doing a more modern JavaScript output, like ES, uh, say 2015 or above, the code just doesn't really change. So debugging is, is not super, um, too much a problem, in my opinion. Uh, ah, somebody's asking, is there a reason why Builder wasn't geared towards a platform like WordPress? Oops, I also realized that my code is maybe being cut off for some of you. Forgive me, I'm still getting used to my, my weird streaming setup I got going on right now. Um, yeah, so why is Builder not like a WordPress plugin? Well, the reality is there are WordPress plugins for visual editing. Now, I know Builder does all this unique stuff like drag and drop your components and import from Figma and generate code and all that stuff. Um, but what we found from my own experience is when people are using modern front end frameworks, there is no such GUI tool. You know, there wasn't before Builder, there wasn't a way that like, hey, if you work at jcrew.com and your marketing team needed to add just like an additional button, let's say we just need a button on that homepage. Oops, I'm clicking things without realizing it. Um, that would be a go back to development cycles, make a ticket, all the stuff like a super annoying. Whereas, you know, a company like jcrew is using like Next.js, React and modern tech. Uh, I worked at a company called ShopStyle where we used Angular. It was all modern Angular components. And there was no visual system for all the new frameworks, right? Builder supports a whole bunch out of the box. And so that's where we saw the big opportunity. And really that's, we want to use our own product and that's how we use it. We don't, I don't use WordPress. Um, you know, I build everything in React or Quick or sometimes Felt or Vue. Uh, and that's where we kind of decided to focus. Um, Linlin asks, is it worth learning front end development now? Hell yes, it is. I would definitely learn front end development right now. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, robotics. I accidentally covered the code. I hope you can see it now. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, everybody's pointing out the can't see the left side of the browser. Apologies for that. Um, this is it hard to, to hire and say, ooh. So question um, from Dober Main saying, hey, I'm in a FinTech bootcamp right now, learning neural networks and going to learn blockchain stuff too. Is it hard to get hired in the space, stuck on a career plan after bootcamp? Um, being hired in tech right now is much harder than it was a few years ago. A few years ago when uh, the interest rates were at 0% and um, every tech company as a result was hiring, uh, stock prices were going up, um, venture capital, the private investors were investing in companies like crazy, tech jobs were everywhere. Um, now there's a lot less because people overhired and they've been reducing staff and making a lot of difficult cuts. And now it's pretty hard. I would say one thing, you know, one question you might have when learning is, should I learn how to build a neural network or should I learn how to use a neural network? Or should I learn how to build my own blockchain or should I learn how to use a blockchain? Um, in my opinion, for practical skills, it's always the use category. Always learn how to use these tools, right? Everyone should know how to use OpenAI's APIs. They're very easy, um, but use it, try it and experiment with it. Try for your use cases. Um, that's where you get the most practical skills. Now for being hired, um, my personal advice, which is unconventional because my career is pretty unconventional. I did not, I do not have a computer science degree. I never finished a four year degree. Um, I didn't even study computer science in college. Um, what I did is I dropped out of school, um, for a variety of reasons. I taught myself programming and to accomplish my own projects, projects that I cared about and wanted to build. And in doing that, I learned a lot of skills. One important one was just how to use tools to accomplish some type of goal. And as it turns out, um, that is the most important thing that a software developer needs to do. <laughs> you know, they just need to use tools to accomplish a goal. And that's what businesses look for. Um, oh, well, Fallen Pentagon dropped out too. Also mentioned jcrew's page is slow. It is quite slow. Um, that is not specifically because of Builder. Um, I'll show you some fast examples. Actually, let's go to Builder's own site. One thing that's cool that actually might be a good segue, let's go to Google PageSpeed Insights. Funny enough, uh, some people found a way to game <laughs> Google PageSpeed Insights. Oh, we're failing Core Web Vitals again. It's so annoying. I think we're falling off one of these metrics, but I'll show you. Our performance score is quite good. Well, there's a lot of college dropouts here, uh, our self-taught programmers. Um, in my opinion, both paths are 100% valid. The teach yourself to program, or learn in a university. Just know one thing, if you learn in a university and you do your four years, ah, our performance is dropping. Um, performance is hard. You gotta always keep on top of it. Ours is 83. Um, we definitely wanna be above 90, but it, it's hard. As your site gets larger, more complex, luckily we use Quick, which makes it a lot easier, but there's some room to improve here. 
Um, ooh, Steven is asking me what's on our roadmap for Gen AI. I do want to talk about that. Um, um, ooh, and some questions about Quick too. So uh, let's talk about, um, and please anybody, if you have additional questions on any of that stuff, drop me out of school. I mean, drop me out of school is it's tough. <laughs> you have to like make your own money. It was a really interesting learning experience uh, to really kind of be out on your own a little bit early. I think I was about 19 when I just said like, I'm going to figure out how to, write code and make money myself. I actually made an app for the iOS app store uh, with a friend and um, it totally flopped. And I was broke <laughs> and I spent like a year building this and it made no money and totally was about to give up. In fact, I was about to move back home with my mom. I remember I called my mom and I was like, hey, um, this whole dropping out of school and teaching myself to code and building an app thing, it didn't work. I'm just a total failure in life. I don't know what I was thinking. I need to move back home. And my mom was the nicest person in the world, but something that surprised me is she basically said, like, we can't take you here. Like, you're on your own. And I was like, what? <laughs> and they're basically like, we can't afford to have you living here. We're not rich in money either. You're 18 plus years old. You know, my family wasn't loaded or anything. Um, and they're like, you're going to have to have a job if you move back home. And so I was arranging. I was like, I have no skills. I clearly can't make an app. And so I was starting to look into, I'm going to apply to bag groceries at a grocery store and move back home, you know, and I have to like pay my parents to live with them. It was very, very depressing. Um, funny enough, a uh, friend of a friend saw the app that uh, a friend and I had made. They were really, really impressed with it and gave me a job. <laughs> right as, I mean, I was right about to give my apartment my, my 30 day notice and, and just totally give up on life. And interesting enough, I joined that that other company, I took that job because I needed money anyway, <laughs> anyway to make money. I was broke. And um, the next thing that happened was the the iOS app that we released blew up. Like it got wildly popular on the app store. And um, it started actually making a lot of money and all this stuff. Um, and it was, it was crazy. And I eventually actually had to shut the thing down because I didn't have time to work on it because I had another job now. And uh, super weird, but just... Anyway, you never know what's going to happen. Learn skills. Um, you know, uh, what app did I make? This app called Jam Kit. It was a game that was really popular for a brief period of time, but eventually flopped. And that was an important learning for like startups, you know, like Builder Now. I think somebody asked, how many people are we? We're a little bit over 50 people. Um, Builder.io. Um, and that's from a whole lot of like learnings. And so the app Jam Kit, it got really popular and then it totally flopped. Builder and other things is something that, um, you know, I learned over time how to make something that's not just a flash in the pan, you know, popular and it goes away, but something that's consistently useful, right? Every day you have to turn designs into code. Every day um, jCrew has to update their homepage and create new pages, Zapier, etc. cetera. Um, oh yeah, Pixel Regal is asking, what am I building? Well, let's talk about, let's, let's try and answer two questions right now. Steven asked, what are we building next on the Gen AI front? And Pixel Rigo said, what are we building? Let me show you something really cool. There's a few things we're working on. So um, let me go back to that Zapier thingy. Um, my computer's being a little bit funky right now. Uh, let's go log in. So let me show you what, uh, what we have in store for the AI of our product. And so let's go back to, I wanna go back to, every time you hear jQuery, I hear jQuery. <laughs> Sorry, let's use Zapier as an example. Or, who else? Um, let's go to the Zapier space. Let me show you some cool stuff we're doing. Um, <laughs> thanks, Doberman. He said I should clip the the background story of, of how my career started and make it a short. Uh, I probably should, actually that's not a bad idea. I should do that. Um, I always need content ideas. I actually can produce content pretty quickly if I just have an idea of what to to make. So I appreciate the ideas. I put out a short on this stuff. Um, let's see. I want to go to the the Zapier demo space. Let me show you kind of some stuff we're working on. So let's go into this home page with OpenAI banner again. Cool. So this is, I'm going to go into a different mode here that I think may make things a little bit easier to see. And cool. I'm not sure if I'm making the browser unhappy here. For those just tuning in, I'm using a new computer and I don't know how to use it. So I'm having to redo a lot of stuff. Okay, there we go. Let's move things over so you can see them a little bit better. Maybe I'll switch to the two column layout. Okay, cool. So here, what does Builder do? Builder takes your React components, you plug it in over an API, and you can literally like visually build stuff. Wow, so this is Zapier's homepage. I can make changes. I can add new components, 
let's add this FAQ block. Let's go in and add new FAQs. These are all just, I'm filling in React components and props. I am a React prop. And in fact, we can see the code at any time too. We can go in here and I'll make this bigger and I'll, I'll turn this off, make this simpler. There we go. So you can see we're literally just using their FAQ section and we're filling in the props. And as we make changes, we're just updating the props. Now, um, the question is, let me move this to fit in here better, oops. Now what are we doing next? So there's a couple interesting things we're doing next. Um, one is making it so that when you make designs that, you know, let's say Zapier has a new design for a homepage. Now we can do cool stuff, like I'll, I'll show you something really neat right now. We can go over to Figma, we can go to a design from Zapier. Let's maybe take uh, one of these sections. This one's kind of cool. Do you want to make impossible possible? Heck yeah, I do. And let's go Builder and let's copy. So I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to jump back over to Builder. I'm going to paste it wherever I want. In fact, maybe we want it. Let's maybe add it right after this cool scrolly banner thing. Um, allow, paste. There we go. So there we go. Oops, I'm going to zoom in, change the zoom a little bit. And there, it's nice and responsive and beautiful. Awesome. And I just copied that from a static design. That's something that is cool, but we did have to recreate all these elements. And let's say this button actually was a button in the, in the code base. And I'll show you again. Like here, we can show, oops, we got an error for some reason. Maybe I did something funky. Who knows? Um, but what we want to do is give you code and then that code should use your components. And that's really, really important. And something that we're working on now that's really interesting is being able to create new things for the Zapier site from a prompt. So I showed you, yeah, I can drag in these React components and we have this cool CLI that scans your components and integrates Builder and lets you drag and drop and it has great performance and all this stuff, cool. But what if you wanna make a brand new page and you know Zapier has a lot of different components. These are the components in their code base. There's a lot, like a lot, a lot. There's so many things in here. What if I just know I want a page about blah? Let's let's show you something cool that we're working on here, where we can say generate components, um, and let's say uh, uh, let's say don't do custom styles, and let's say um, make a homepage body about why Zapier loves Builder.io so much. And we can be very specific too. Use a centered hero at the top, and a few more sections about the great value props of the builder visual development platform. Okay, we'll let that run. This will take a moment and it's totally experimental. It's it's not ready to be shipped yet, so this could break. Um, we'll show you what happens. There we go, <laughs> check it out. We're basically designing a new page here. And in fact, I can show you the code being generated in real time too. Let me move this out of the way. See how we're creating, now forgive me, it's gonna be flashing because I need to fix this UI. Um, but see how it's using the hero centered and the props and these two column rivers, there we go. And this is what it generated. A very, very simple page. Um, we obviously could have been more elaborate and said add buttons and sections and heroes and whatever, but it's kind of cool. And we can come in and still visually edit all of this, you know, change the heading color, you know, to different colors that are available or add buttons, you know, wahoo, or just tell the AI to do it. The AI can edit it as well. And this is kind of cool when you just want to pump out new things. Um, another thing we're experimenting with is doing this right inside of Figma. So if you have Figma and you just want to take uh, your design system and make new designs and then just export to code or just publish them to your live site, um, we can allow you to just say what you want. It's like your product manager, you just need to make a new modal. Say, I want a modal with these things, automatically build it out on brand, and then be able to then suck it into Builder and publish it or just turn it into code. And again, you can grab code for anything and copy and paste it into your code base, which is pretty cool. Um, let's see. Hey, Joshua, how's it going? Um, I'm gonna try and answer more questions. If you all have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna try not to keep cutting stuff off over here so you can see the code better. Apologies, I was showing code, but then the code was probably not, not visible. I can actually jump back, deselect everything and show you the full code. Pretty cool. Um, now, uh, a couple things. Oh my God, Steven, use builder at dex.com. Amazing, I'd love to hear it. If you have any feature requests, hit, hit, them, hit me in the uh, chat here. I'm always curious, or just questions in general. Um, one question from Mr. is, are there any limitations for quick and bigger projects? Um, short answer is no. Quick was really built for 
um, large scale projects. It's really adopting a technique used by Google to power Google search, Google photos, very large scale Google products, and be able to then um, have a very large physical code base with very, very large scale without uh, a dip in performance. Um, um, and so the short answer is, you know, every framework can be fast and easy at small scale. Quick is particularly designed to be very fast and flexible and easy at large scale. So I would definitely anticipate, I would say, try it out and uh, see if you hit any hurdles, but you should be really happy. And the people, some of the companies looking into Quick right now deeply are very, very, very large scale businesses trying to replace key parts like checkout flows. Um, uh, hey, Prof, Profs AI. Um, I did not answer a question about cooperation. Can you rewrite the question? I'm happy to answer it. Um, and then Dobermain, can I have it communicate to Ticketmaster API? Definitely. Actually, everything, if we're talking about Builder, all this stuff can actually come over APIs. You can actually visually connect your API and say, hey, get the hero title from an API endpoint or any of that, which is cool. Um, do you have a specific Node version you use with Quick? Not necessarily. Um, you need to use a modern Node.js version. I can't remember what the constraint is, but you shouldn't. You won't have to be on the newest, newest. For example, um, it's pretty flexible. How does it compare to Vue? Vue is awesome. Quick's reactivity is much like Vue's reactivity. Quick uses JSX, TSX, um, but the big advantage of Quick compared to the typical React or Vue or Svelte frameworks is that technique uh, that Mishko the creator calls reusability, borrowed from um, Google, um, which powers the Google search is the ability to have really, really fast loading pages that do not hydrate. So you do not run a bunch of JavaScript when a page loads. Instead, you just get something much more like plain HTML. So if you love something like Astro and you love that it's just fast, um, but you need lots of interactivity and you don't want to load a framework and you don't want to have to write all this manual line by line imperative jQuery style JavaScript, Quick is a really good solution. You can write very advanced components in a very React-like style. But um, what you get out the other side is a plain HTML. You're not downloading executing JavaScript you don't need, which is a huge performance improvement. Um, ooh, web components. Somebody always asks about web components. I hate web components. I love the idea. I, I really don't love the execution of them. I thought at one point that Builder would use web components for everything. I'll show you a, a, an example here really quickly. Builder.io slash docs. Um, oh, this is navigating to slash C. Oh, interesting. Sorry, we've got a little redirect bug going on. So when you want to have, um, let's do this. When you have a situation where you want to support many, many frameworks. So in here, I'm going to actually make this a little bigger. So it, there we go. Um, integrating pages. I'm having some weird issues where pages are not loading correctly for me. I am using a new computer that I don't usually use, and I feel like I have a Chrome extension going on. Oh, oh, JavaScript's blocked. Okay, sorry. I did like a weird Chrome syncing thing. How do I unblock the JavaScript? Hold on, everybody. I think I have a, uh, a Chrome extension turning this off. One moment, please. There we go. Hey, okay, fixed now. Okay, so Builder, integrating Builder. So that drag and drop editing, you can integrate to any site. And let's show you how really briefly. So here is a bunch of frameworks we support. We actually have a tool that automates this integration. So you don't even have to write any of this code. We have our tool will generate it in your code base for you. But look at all, we're, you know, pages router for Next.js, app router, which has some important nuanced differences, Quick, Swift, React, Remix, Hydrogen, Nuxt, Vue, Svelte, Gatsby, Angular, all these things. You would think web components is the ideal solution, and that's what we thought at first too, until we realized two huge issues with web components. First one is they do not have a standard way to server-side render. The problem is you make web components, that's really web components is just a, a name describing a couple browser APIs like custom elements, shadow DOM, etc. And if you use a web component out of the box in React and other frameworks, they only load client side, and that's just no good. Content created in Builder needs to load fast, server-side, static, etc. And Web Components is not a good solution for that. Second issue is Web Components, while they try to be on interoperable with frameworks, they're not fully interoperable. So let's say, for example, you have some React code where um, I might be able to find an example here. Let's do Pages Router. Pages Router is actually kind of simpler in some ways. 
where like you create some context, then you load builder content, then you load your component inside, and that component consumes the context with so child consuming parent context. Web components have no awareness of React context. That's why we made mitosis. And mitosis actually allows you to generate components for all frameworks that supports server-side rendering, static rendering, all the features, props, context, hooks, etc. Way, 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 way nicer solution in my opinion. Um, let's see. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm going through questions, trying to find the best question. Somebody asked about publishing. Maybe they're asking about publishing and builder. The beautiful thing about publishing and builder is this thing that I generated, I literally can just hit the publish button and it's live. Now this is not actually hooked up to Zapier's site, but if Zapier wanted to add a button, rearrange their homepage, run an A-B test, literally can do that and just runs over APIs, which is really cool. Um, let's see, some questions coming in. <laughs> um, so CHM on TikTok asks, Kind of unrelated, but what's your daily routine? Or more specifically, when do you code? This is a funny question. So for those of you that you don't know, um, and I got another question like this before. It asked how long I've been coding. I've been coding for, oh goodness, I started when I was around like 16, at least dabbling, and now I'm 33. So how long is that? Is that 17 years? 17 years of coding? Um, I think more serious coding started around 19, so maybe call it like 15 years, 14 years of coding. Um, but, um, so I've been doing it a long time, but as you all may know, I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of the company I was just showing you actually, builder.io. So we do, you know, what we call visual development, which means turn designs into code, turn designs into live sites, drag and drop with your app components to publish updates on your site. It's sort of like a solution to, um, the problem I had in the past, which was I ran web engineering for a company called ShopStyle. The marketing team wants to change the site every day, add a button here, add a section here, da da da. We tried a headless CMS, but the way headless CMSs handle schemas and, and all this stuff, you end up having to manually code up like all this stuff. It was a pain. Deploy for the updates to go live just for a button or whatever. Huge pain. Update schemas. Rework all the things. Blah, it, it, everybody hated it. And one day the marketing team grabbed, um, they're frustrated, everything took forever on the website. And they grabbed Webflow. So Webflow is just like a draw, drag and drop site builder. And they first asked, can we power our site with Webflow? And I said, no, our website was like a very advanced, had a lot of custom business logic stuff that you can't just code into Webflow. We had to build our own Angular or uh, React apps. Um, but what they did is they grabbed Webflow, they made some page they've been asking for forever. And they came to me and they're like, hey, we made this page in Webflow. Can you just kind of copy and paste it onto the shop style site, which is an Angular site? And I had to explain that's not how these things work. Um, but it begged the question, like, what if? And that's where Builder's Visual Editor was born. Let's make a way to connect. Let's give you a React component you can plug into your site, plus an API that can just power content wherever you want. You can say this region should just be drag and drop editable. Marketing team will create and own it. Um, the developers can set rules and restrictions and permissions on who can edit what. And then you can just take your components and just drag and drop them, change the props, and publish. And then it gets powerful when anything you make in that editor can turn into code and you can copy and paste it when you want. And you can import anything from Figma. So you can import from Figma and publish or import from Figma and turn into code and paste into your code base. And you know, my routine for many, many years was, you know, wake up in the morning, have breakfast and code all day. <laughs> you know, that was the extent of it, uh, straightforward. Uh, now my routine's very different. You know, as the CEO of a startup that's a little over 50 people, um, a lot of what I do is, um, whatever people need from me that day. So there's, I, I don't get to control my schedule that much. Actually, I do do some weird things, which one is I wake up really, really early in the morning. Uh, the reason for that is our team is distributed all around the globe. We have team members in, in at least 10 different countries around the world, so all across different time zones. And so my meetings start really early. The only time I can code in peace is really early in the morning because nobody expects me to be in meetings before like 7 a.m. in the morning, right? I tell people I won't even meet with them before 8 a.m. Even if you're like the CTO of Abercrombie and Fitch, <laughs> still like 8 a.m. or later is the soonest I'll meet. And I work from home. I'm actually in my bedroom right now. This is just a gray wall in my bedroom. My bed is right on the other side of this computer. Um, I live in a small apartment in San Francisco. Um, but um, I wake up early. Like this morning, I woke up at 4.30 a.m. I don't do that because I'm not like, I'm not one of those people who's like, yeah, ice bath in the morning, wake up early, get ahead. It's like, no, it's like, it's just if I can wake up early, I can get some coding in before meetings. And as soon as meetings start, my brain can't code very well after that. I just start thinking of everybody else's problems in the meetings. And, you know, if I could just wake up early and get some code done, that's what I do. So 
early in the morning, let's say on average 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., I'm writing some code. Um, then I have meetings. I don't really control what meetings or whatever because you know who needs what is kind of something that's always changing. And then uh, I will try and squeeze in time for additional code or, or content or anything like that as well. Um, morning routine video. <laughs> I can make a video. My morning routine's not interesting though. I wake up. Uh, I go to the living room. Uh, I drink a Soylent. It's like a meal drink that's kind of inexpensive and, and theoretically relatively healthy. Um, and start coding. It's not even... And I brush my teeth. Um, yes, Pixel Regal's the CEO as well and knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, you definitely don't control your schedule when you're CEO. Uh, everybody needs something. You basically tell half of them yes and half of them no. And the ones you told yes, fill up your calendar and that's it. You wake up, you see what's in your calendar, you do what people need. And every once in a while you get irritated and you, you're like, wait a second, I need to make some direction for people and you kind of take the reins a little bit, but it's always a push pull. You take the reins for a bit and you back off for a bit. Yeah. Um, oh yes. Uh, Spidgems. I don't know how to pronounce it. Ask is builder a good way for a solar founder to do both the design and code and just move faster. hundred percent. Um, so if you just want to use builder, the, the simplest way I'd say an individual can get value out of builder.io is Make your designs for anything you want to do in Figma. There's a million ways to make your designs in Figma, right? You can use design systems. You can make them from scratch. You can use templates. You can buy. That's always, in my opinion, the best place to start with front ends. Start with a Figma design. And then use Builder to import that into code um, and or to then just publish it to your website. But if you just need to get new front ends built, totally. Just go in and take designs, turn them into code, publish them. Don't even have to use Builder's APIs or other features, excuse me, just copy paste the code and let Builder save you a lot of time not having to um, write out all that markup in particular by hand. Paste into your code base and then just rock and roll. Um, oh, Solomon asks, my children don't disturb. I don't have any children. I'm hoping to have children in a couple years actually, but as of right now, uh, I don't. And so I'm able to use uh, the extra hours that I'm not tending to children for coding. And sometimes make a video, sometimes streaming, you know, you never know. Um, oh, Fallen Pentagon says that they took a management position and hated it, uh, was mostly meetings. Uh, so he, uh, or they demoted themselves back to an engineer, but got to keep the management salary. Oh, that's cool. That's a pretty ideal situation. A lot of developers don't like moving to management. Um, when developers move to management, they realize they're no longer doing what they enjoy, coding, and instead they are, um, having to take meetings and deal with stuff that doesn't feel like it's moving the business forward in a lot of cases. Um, when you have reports, when you have um, uh, developers who report into you, um, you know, the people you manage, they always have problems. <laughs> and their problems matter a lot to them. And the problems may or may not matter that much to you, or they may not feel that significant. You often might feel like, hey, you should just not be bothered by that. But unlike a computer where you can just program, like, hey, don't, do that <laughs> with people and their thoughts and their feelings you can't so you end up dealing with that and those things are valid and important but you might think like i'm actually a really good developer or pretty good or at least uh, a useful developer i can write code that functions and i'm spending all day talking to somebody who's really frustrated with somebody else in an unresolvable situation person a likes things a certain way person b likes it another way there's no resolution besides you just got to hear them out and get tedious and I've seen a lot of developers in their careers go bounce back and forth between being a manager and a so and a, just a developer. And a lot of people do it, and I, I totally get it. Um, uh, in my opinion, I I don't know. My ideal, personally, is I like doing like um, a hybrid role where I can still write code. And in my case, that might mean that I'm just waking up early in the morning to write code. It's not part of my 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 responsibilities on paper, but I still want to do it. Um, I very much have the opinion that engineering managers, at least if you're um, a manager right above the uh, individual contributors, meaning there's developers writing code and they report directly to you. If you're a manager of individual contributors, individual coders, and you don't code at all, um, you definitely are very at a high risk of not understanding the day-to-day -day challenges those developers have. And you start to fall into this kind of bureaucr bureaucratic entanglement where, I'll take a simple example. One time the developers, I go through periods of not coding because the CEO job, there's a lot. In fact, one person asked, do I do this seven days a week? No, I actually very strictly only work five days a week. 
I don't work on the weekends. I guess you could call this working, but I do this for fun. I do fun stuff on the weekends. I play video games. I've been playing um, uh, the finals lately. It's pretty fun. I used to play Apex a lot. Battlefield is pretty fun. Um, but yeah, I very strictly only work five days a week because burnout is a thing. Everybody in software engineering, I hope you know, burnout is a thing. Even if you feel like you could work seven days a week, 18 hours a day, don't. Or at least don't do it for very long. If you're doing a crunch to get a release out, that can be fine sometimes. But burnout is ugly. Burnout will creep up on you. Burnout's very hard to fix when you are in it. It's very hard to recognize that your productivity is so down, your, your mental state might be so down. And so I very much urge everybody, do not work seven days a week. Uh, hello. Hey, Arson. Thank you for greeting me from Egypt. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Greetings from I'm in San Francisco. Um, let's see. Ah, so Profs AI asks, would you agree that web components cannot be beaten when it comes to performance? Web components definitely can be beaten. It depends on the metric you're looking at. So in a lot of cases, core web vitals are, are critical, um, like Google's PageSpeed Insights. It would be very hard. Well, it depends. Um, the way that somebody like Alex Russell recommends using web components is really a very kind of server-side first approach. So you really render everything server-side, like with a framework like um, Laravel or Astro, and then you use very little web components to encapsulate small DOM mutations for small interactivity. That can be very, very, very performant. But if you try and use web components in a way like people write React apps, which I really like, I love the composability of React, I don't love how React server components have introduced two mental models of composability. Frameworks like Quick, I think Quick is the only framework that in my opinion really well fixes this, as well as Marco, actually. Do not sleep on Marco. Marco is very good and very performant. Marco and Quick take the idea of components, um, think of them kind of like Astro components, server first components, or like React server components. Components that by default are fully composable, which you would not want to use web components in this way. If you use web components in this way, where you make everything as a web component and you kind of compose them together, you're going to get only client-side rendering. You're going to have a lot of JavaScript to download and render. You will not do well on these metrics, like first contentful paint, largest um, total blocking time. Um, layout shift should be fine. Speed index should be fine and relevant. Um, wow, Pixel Regal said their paid speed insights went up to 98 thanks to Quick. That's amazing. Um, I need to debug why our website's slowing down a little bit. It's possible because we've added some third-party scripts that are not going through Party Town, and so that could be what it is. But we can go to like quick.builder.io or some other examples, and we'll see even faster sites, which is cool. But yeah, I mean, for the best possible performance, you want as little JavaScript to execute on your site as possible. And web components don't natively help you there. In fact, they can be counterproductive because by default they only execute client-side, which means anything that's in a web component has to um, download and execute in the browser, which is the worst thing you can do for performance. Um, a more server-first framework like Astro, React, Server Components, um, Quick, or Marco has a huge advantage that it's server-first, like Laravel or Ruby on Rails or whatever. So now you're narrowing it down. In fact, let's talk about this. Let's go to Excaladraw. Let's narrow this down. Let's say, hey, client-side rendering equals, um, let me move this thing out of the way. There we go. Okay, best perf equals server-side rent equals, I actually say this, um, minimal, minimal client JS. So what makes your site slow? is if when you load the page, in order to render or order to be interactive, you need to download all the code for all the components, you need to execute it all, and then it's available. And you could say, yeah, static site generation is a help, um, or server-side rendering. That's the starting point. I'm actually going to assume for now that we're doing the basic best practices, which means we're definitely gonna make sure that the page is pre-cached and pre-rendered. Pre-rendered means static, um, rendered, server-side rendered with a CDN cache, um, incremental static, whatever, who cares? You're getting HTML fast from a server, right, from a CDN cache. But the problem comes in, there's a lot of websites out there that are static, statically rendered, um, but still very, very, very slow. Let's take a simple example. So I'm going to go to Nike.com. See how that initial page loaded fast? That was a from the cache immediate statically uh, generated page. Now let's go to PageSpeed Insights for Nike.com. And I love Nike, and I love their engineering team, by the way. So take this as an example of how the typical way we develop code 
is challenged by the fundamentals of the approaches that our frameworks take. So I'll explain what I mean there. Um, but Nike is very good developers. They care about performance. They write with modern frameworks like React. And still, you'll see how their, their performance actually performs. And they're using statically generated um, pages. Um, and I'll show you in a minute. The performance is not great. And I'll explain why. I'll go back to the Excel draw and explain why that is um, once this loads. I don't want to... Let's see. People talk about, hey, when can we use Rust for the front end? You can, but WebAssembly does not have some of the facets we need that JavaScript has. Um, so, yeah, there's no way to write pure Rust for the front end just yet. There are sort of ways to do it, and there are some cool frameworks like Leptos. Here we go. Nike got a three. <laughs> that was a statically generated page. That was a three. Why? Why was the fast page so slow? And the reason why is this the blocking time. Um, now, there's a few factors here, but if you have a page that's effectively pre-generated, but it's getting a three out of 100, what that means is the page is not yet able to be interacted with. The typical way this goes, um, let's go back over here. The typical workflow you find here is, um, oops, is, uh, let's duplicate, cool. So typical request response cycle is the server sends HTML, but the HTML is kind of a facade. It's not interactive yet. If I went to nike.com and tried to click something immediately, it's not yet. I tried to click the hamburger menu immediately. The page isn't hydrated yet, so it's, it's dummy HTML. So I'm gonna actually send that, sends dummy HTML. You can see the contents, that's good, and it takes us a moment to process what we're seeing before we interact. So that's why this has been an acceptable pattern. But the next thing you need to do is you need to hydrate, aka make HTML interactive. This is where all the problems come in. The worst way to hydrate, the worst way to make HTML interactive is to download into the browser all of the code that produced that HTML in the first place. Execute all of it, including all the dependencies. And this can take, let's go back to Nike or Google Page of Insights, you might say like, oh, it doesn't take long. Well, if your application actually has some moderate scale, um, where did we put, do I have that in a different tab? This took 17 seconds on a mobile device. That was so much code that was downloaded. And the Nike page is pretty static, right? At face value, this is just HTML and images. Why does it take 18 seconds on a mobile device to allow us to start interacting, allow us for these menus to work, stuff like that? Well. It's because it's written in React. And in React, um, what you're doing is all that code you wrote that generates the HTML is also downloading the browser, executing, essentially re-rendering everything. It's not clobbering the DOM nodes. It's really binding to the DOM nodes that are there. And this can take a freaking long time. 18 seconds. That's a lot. I want to add some dr drama here. 18 seconds. What the heck? That's a huge problem. That's 18 seconds where the page looks like it's interactive, but it's not. And it's going to feel sluggish. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a mobile device on a relatively fast network. I was in Peru the last two weeks. And there are a lot of places I did not have a fast network. And honestly, my home. I live in San Francisco. You think I have a fast network all the time. I do not. Right now, I have, if my Wi-Fi is off, let me show you what I have. I can hold this up to the camera in a moment. I have one bar. That's it. Can you all see that? I have one bar. <laughs> I can't hardly download any website. It drives me crazy. I take my dog on a walk, and that's because I'm in, like, there's a hilly, there's a lot of hills in San Francisco. In the hills, you get bad cell reception. You don't always have direct, like, line of sight to a cell tower. And so um, I try and take my dog on a walk, and I'm trying to load up just a chart. You would think, like, a site like Amplitude that just shows charts would be just HTML. It's not just HTML. It is... Uh, a ton of JavaScript. Like you would think, if I wanted to look at a chart of you know our traffic, that it, I would just load some HTML and it's good. No, it's going to download tons of JavaScript. It's going to render it all client side. Blah, terrible. So hydration is the huge problem here. And then when you're finally done, then you have interactive site. We're done. The thing can be used. And let me talk about what Google did to solve this problem. Google has the best solution to date. In fact. 
you might say, um, what do I want? Alt V. How do I do a check? Sorry, I don't. How do I do a check mark in, in Windows? I don't know. Um, but yes, check, check. <laughs> So the question is, how do we reduce this hydration? The problem is we want to download less JavaScript, we want to execute less JavaScript. So let's go to Google really quickly. Have you ever noticed that Google is insanely fast? I hope you have. Let's search builder.io. In fact, let's search something that somebody's probably never searched before. Let's search builder.io walrus. You're still instant. Nobody's ever searched builder.io walrus, but like it was instantly fast. Now they queried the entire web, they showed this page, and it was all instantly interactive. I could have clicked any of these things immediately. There's a trick they use. And Google is a huge scale website. I can search something like weather. And I get these weather widgets that are interactive and totally unique, right? I can click, awesome. I can search movies. And I see a whole set of movies that are out with all this interactivity. And you notice the interactivity is instant. I'm just searching a thing and it happens. Let's do uh, sports. I don't even know if this does anything special. I guess not. Well, it's got these different widgets. If this was a React app that was producing these pages, we would be downloading so much unnecessary junk, even if we tried really hard to structure it because of all these dynamic elements that could be on here. So what did Google do? Google invented an approach that was new here. Oops, I'm slightly off camera. Apologies. Let me get this back on camera. Um, Google invented an approach where they could deliver the page as pure HTML. And then, oh, let's do a lighthouse check on Google. Yeah, let's do that. It's actually not that bad. Um, it's a lot better than Nike. It's a lot better than three. Now, keep in mind, Google should really use Party Town because with Party Town, one of the biggest problems Google has is their analytics. So if you look at, um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, some questions here about SSR performance. I'll get back to this in a minute. Um, Client side redirect, who cares? Um, oh, error, error, error. Oh, okay, I probably should have just redone. Excuse me, read on that. Let's go back here. Let's delete this. Apologies for burping on camera. Oh my goodness. One thing I hate about Google is they add all this junk in the URLs. Like, what is all this shit? Like, can't you just put like a little identifier in the URL and like all the other stuff, you know, stems from that? Um, all right, let's let this run for a minute. Uh, let's, with updated URL, sure. Sorry slash index, what the heck? Okay, why don't we just do the Google homepage? <laughs> That'll make our lives easier. Um, I know what this will give. This will give us something like, I think, somewhere between 50 and 70. Um, but we'll show it in a minute. Do you mean that I can use SSR for more performance? Uh, no. Somebody asked, do I mean you can use SSR for more performance? No. So I am assuming that you have a modern app where you have this uh, cached, which means it's instant. So that HTML... So you won't squeeze any more performance here out of SSR because the HTML really just returns instantly. In 20 milliseconds, you get the HTML. The problem is in this step. This is the big problem step. We're going to put a box around that and we're going to give it um, a red. How do I do this? Why is Excaljaw not showing me options suddenly? OK, we're going to have to refresh Excaljaw because it's not letting me change. What's going on? Oh, I'm in Zen mode. Okay, don't know how I did that. Okay, so this is the problem step. So let's talk about what Google did and let's look at Google's performance really quickly. PageBeat Insights, Google, 71. For as extremely complicated of a website, extremely personalized, extremely rich with all sorts of features throughout, that's a shockingly good score, especially at their scale, the amount of engineers that work on this website. Everything is server first, right? But that's not new, Ruby on Rails, PHP, whatever, that's not new. Um, and what you lack with the server-first approach, in fact, Google's framework is called Wiz, W-I-Z. Let's talk about Wiz. Wiz is not fun to write. Um, Wiz is a very clever approach, but it's not something that you can enjoy writing because it's not just simple components you can compose. You actually have to write Java templates and you have to write like a jQuery style kind of editing stuff. But let's talk about how Wiz works. So I'm gonna go into, um, uh, and here, I think I'll want this, language mode, HTML. Okay, so typically, like we talked about, React, um, yeah, Google SEO 85, pretty good. Um, so typical React is we download everything, we execute everything, and now it's interactive. That's the worst case scenario, right? The best case scenario is you, you just have HTML, header, you know, da-da-da. Oh yeah, let's let, uh, there we go. 
This is the... Mm, that's not a good suggestion. Come on, get a pill bullet. What would be after a header? Maybe a main, a section. Let's make a section here. Give me some contents. Oh my god, it's giving me PHP. <laughs> get a pill bullet is not being super smart right now. Whatever. The ideal situation here is from a performance perspective, the ideal situation is we just deliver HTML instantly, right? That's what we want. Um, and then when there's interactivity needed, we can do it the really old school way, which is we just add a script tag. And we say, hey, you know, uh, document.query selector, uh, so we have some button, you know, add event listener, you know, whatever. So here we added some silly code that when we click the button, we change the H1 to have a red color, right? This is what ideal performant code kind of looks like. Pure HTML, inline JavaScript. What React does and all the other common frameworks do is they're downloading way more JavaScript than this. They're downloading the framework, they're downloading all the components, the components as JavaScript. So all this HTML in a JavaScript format, which looks like React.createElements uh, a bunch of times over, like a ton of React.createElement everywhere. You're downloading gobbles of code. It's not what we want. And you're executing all that too. We don't want that. So we want the end state to look like this. But Google takes a step further because the amount of scripts that might, you know, event listeners that might need to be registered can also grow quite large with all the interactivity they have. So they do something really cool. What Wiz does is they do this. They have this like, in fact, let's look at their code. It may be a little hard to see. Um, in fact, yeah, this actually might not be, uh, let's do it, whatever. Let's go google.com. Let's open up the uh, developer tools, which I don't even know how to do that in Windows. I'm using a Windows computer for the first time today. And for those who have not <laughs> seen me talk about that yet. Uh, dev tools, more tools, developer tools. There we go. Okay, got lucky. Let's move this down below. And let's select this button and let's see. Um, oh yeah, this is gonna be a form. So where's the form? Oh, it's using form actions. Okay, this one's cheating. Let's go over here. If I don't find a good example here, I'll just show you the technique because it might be easier to show that way. Oh, it's just a link. Okay, I'm just gonna show you the technique because it's a little bit easier to just show in, in pseudocode. What they do is they add special attributes. Um, why didn't Google open source Wiz? So from what I understand, Wiz is very baked into how, um, you may have noticed this, like you might work at a company that has some code where you say, oh, we should open source that. Well, the problem is that code is like intertwined with so many other things. It's not easy to just rip out because to rip that out, you got to you got to open source this other piece and this other piece. And so it just hasn't been a priority for Google. But also the developer experience isn't that great. And one thing I've learned from all these journeys of making open source projects and, and projects and products for developers and stuff is developer experience and user experience is like the most important thing. And if you're gonna open source something that doesn't have a great developer experience, you're just gonna open yourself up to tragic criticisms, tons of problems, it's just gonna be a big waste of time. Um, and so, but what Wiz does is it's something like this. On click equals and a path to a file. Let's say click handler.js. Okay. Um, and a better example would be to put this in a button. So let's actually do that really quickly. Let's go, let's just redo this real quickly. Let's say button and, uh, let's, oh, don't put links inside buttons. Ah, oh, GitHub Copilot's giving bad suggestions today. Don't put links inside buttons. Um, I'll just say click me. Um, and then let's do on click equals click.js. Um, oh, thank you, Utopian Mind. F12 opens dev tools. That's really helpful to know on Windows, learning Windows. Anyway. So this is what Wiz does. Instead of having JavaScript in line, it, it serializes paths to small bits of JavaScript to run for each individual thing. Um, oh, one question, would HTMX be an alternative? Kind of. What Google does is kind of like HTMX, but also different. HTMX would do this a little bit differently. They would do something like, you know, HTMX, what do they call it? HTMX git, git equals, and a path to an API. So the HTMX way would be something like this where an API returns new HTML and you would set the outer HTML or whatever. Um, in the case of, and I'm not doing this right, I forget what the exact format is. In the case of Wiz, it's a similar technique, but different. But we're gonna say on the click event, so similar in some ways, but path to a little bit of JavaScript to run. Um, this can actually have some performance advantages because 
what you do is when the page loads, you find all these little files and you need some kind of comp compiler to generate all these little JavaScript files. And what you do is you prefetch them immediately. So as soon as the, um, as soon as the uh, page loads, you prefetch all the JavaScript, but you don't have to execute any of it. You have a little bit of global JavaScript, uh, a constant amount, one little bit for regardless of your, your website or page size, there's only one little bit you do. And what it does is it looks for these, these special attributes. And as soon as you say, click this button, it's going to execute this click.js file. That file's already been pre-downloaded, but again, not executed. So let's go back to our graph really quickly and show this in perspective. Um, so when you send HTML, and in the case of Wiz, this is no longer dummy HTML. So let's make a copy of this. Do, 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 do. Copy with Wiz. It's not actually dummy HTML. How do I go back to Zen mode? Let me know how to do Zen mode in this thing. That was nice because it didn't show all those overlays, which are annoying. Zen mode. Anybody seen Zen mode? How do you do Zen mode in this thing? I did it on accident somehow. Lock? I don't know. Zen. I'm, gonna, I'm about to ask ChatGPT. Anyway, um, so with Wiz, this is not dummy HTML. This is actually HTML because even if those files have not pre-downloaded, they can just be fetched on demand from what they call a bootloader, a little bit of scripts that can execute the code attached to the special click attributes. Um, and then, um, haha, Mr. Saying it's great to be all these questions. Yeah, it's a bit of a live. Again, anybody keep asking questions. I try and see them. It's hard to talk and read at the same time. So I miss questions sometimes, but please keep sending them. Um, and then you will never, so the this is the most amazing part. There is no hydration. So, um, I'm going to change the size here, uh, but I don't want to, how do I do Zen mode in this thing? Do I right click Zen mode? Reading mode? Nope. Zen mode. I have no idea. Sorry, I don't know how to do Zen mode. Um, anyway, there's no hydration in Wiz. We can just delete that entirely. Nothing is executing when that page loads. Um, HTMX is the opposite of SSR, kind of. It's, it's the opposite of client-side rendering, I think, I would say. Opposite of CSR, really. But anyway, we get HTML, the site's interactive. It's basically instant. Now, there's a download step. The JavaScript you need to run needs to download. It'll eager download those immediately. None of it's blocking the main thread. The problem with the Nike example is when hydration happens, when all this JavaScript's downloading and executing, JavaScript executing blocks the browser's main thread, meaning you can't do anything. Even if the code for this button has downloaded and it's interactive, but you're hydrating this other part of the page, clicking that button isn't gonna respond at all because all this other JavaScript has to execute. When the React team says, oh, they have this like scheduling system and the hydration's not as, as expensive, they're right to a limited extent, but they're also not right. People end up having big components and the big components n cannot, um, execute in an interruptible way. React's like, yeah, you can interrupt the rendering. You can't interrupt synchronous JavaScript execution. You can definitely, per component, once you let each component um, run, you can actually take a queue and run it. But it's like the way it's described and the way it actually is, there's, there's a pretty sizable gap and you can't just interrupt arbitrary JavaScript code running. They do some clever smart tricks, but in my opinion, it's not good enough, especially at large scale. With the Wiz approach, let's add a little underline here. Yeah. Ooh, and it's not red because this is, this is good. We need to download a bit of JavaScript. So let's still say we have to download some JavaScript here, but the download can be prioritized, which is really cool. Meaning um, if you're starting to preload some stuff, but you click on this button, we can prioritize that, download it and execute it. And again, the main thread is never blocked during all this stuff, which is really, really good. Um, um, so what's, nice about this is the performance characteristics. It's going to be, this is the fastest way to execute a, a website possible, like bar none. Um, in the sense that this lazy execution of JavaScript is much faster than having script tags where you have to, um, you know, document, dot query selector, all this stuff. And in fact, this is a good example. This is actually kind of like what this does, except in a more abstract and generic way. But if we had to eager write all these event listeners, 
it's still a lot of JavaScript to execute, even just to set up. React is more expensive because it's actually also executing rendering code and binding code. But anyway, let's just assume for a second, you're like, hey, Ruby on Rails or PHP is the fastest way. It's still not. Uh, the way Wiz does it is the fastest and most scalable way. Now, the problem though, is you want something that feels like React. You want to have um, components you can just compose, right? And that's what Quick does. That's what's so unique about Quick is you can write components. Uh, let's make a, a new little file here. And we'll just say um, quick.tsx. Um, I didn't even spell that right. Hold on, I, I'm not even spelling our own framework here. Quick.tsx. Uh, let's go back. Okay, now you can actually just write. Now technically you have to import. I don't have Quick installed, so I'm gonna skip one import you have to do. But yeah, you're just gonna write your thing, my thing. And you can return you know, hello world. And anything, let's say this is a button. Oops, button. Oops, live coding, always challenging. And we can say on click equals, now technically I'm in, in a Next.js project, but with quick you'd add a dollar sign here, but uh, TypeScript will complain. Um, we can say hello world. The reality is this will work just like React, but it'll execute just like Wiz, and that's the dream. Because even when React started adding the server components, mm -hmm. they came with all these rules. The server component can't have a click end, or you have to have a client component. The client component has a hydrate, and you have to refactor your code to strictly separate the server and the client. With Quick, you don't have to at all. Quick has a unified execution model. You just write components, but they execute in that most optimal way that Wiz kind of set the foundation for. Um, uh, good question um, from Nardit. <laughs> I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, what happens with shared JavaScript? Uh, do they get fetched on the fly or are they prefetched also? Um, so with shared JavaScript, those are prefetched as well. And so what's cool about Quick is we actually can do two methods of prefetching. Method one is just prefetch everything. Now keep in mind, what Quick does, it's really interesting, is it will um, only fetch what could execute in the browser. So it's kind of like automatic React server components. It's like kind of what you might dream React server components actually was. So in the case, I don't have a default formatter. Okay, hold on, let's configure our default formatter prettier. There we go. Okay, so let's say we have um, giant components, giant static components. Cool. And actually, I'm gonna change this to JSX so I can go a little hog wild uh, without it complaining about missing, yeah, types and stuff like that. Okay, up to Amber, sure. Okay, so in this case, let's say we have a giant static component. It's huge, but it only, gen it only spits out non-interactive HTML. And here we have our button. The beautiful thing is my component here will only send to the client console log hello world. Um, that's the cool part. All of the other bits that are only static and server side, those will not go into the client whatsoever. That is wildly beautiful because that's the dream. <laughs> With React server components, you have to make sure that this was a server component and this was its own server client component. Refactor, refactor, blah, I hate refactoring, especially if it's just for performance. Um, in this case, we're only gonna send the bare minimum. And so let's say this has dependencies though. Let's say we're doing something awful like moments. <laughs> moments, new, oops, oh goodness, everything's going crazy. Moments, new date, you know, whatever. And let's say we're just logging this. Now we have a dependency, and that dependency will, in fact, be prefetched as well. But what's interesting is um, the default way of prefetching is just prefetch all interactive code, meaning this is the only interactive code, all the other stuff is not. So in the worst case, Quick will only prefetch the stuff that is interactive. So that's great. It's already shredding out all the other stuff completely automatically, fancy compiler magic. It's not even difficult compiler magic, to be honest. It's just the, the nature of the, uh, the runtime model of Quick lends to this. The, uh, the run times that React views felt that are used, it just, it, this is not possible. They would have to really rebuild the whole framework in order to make it possible. Um, but anyway, once we have this, you know, that's great. But what Quick can also do is can do a prioritized fetch. So there's this cool tool called Quick Insights. Let me show you this. It's really neat. It's totally free too. Um, quick Insights. It's a quick lab. And what this is, let me move this over so y'all can see it. Um, what this is, 
is a way to um, plug in a component that does something really cool. All you do is add this component and this key, and then um, I think you also need to add a Vite plugin. And what it'll do is it'll look at the runtime behavior of your site. So let's let's go back to this, and let's say there's two buttons. There's Hello World that's expensive. Oops, I just changed my. Oh goodness. Let's go back here. Default. Okay. Let's say we have this this button that's expensive and rarely clicked on, and let's say we have this button that's inexpensive, like Add to Cart, and it's just going to do something simple like, you know, add something to cart, add to cart. And let's say in the actual um, real world usage of your site or app, add to cart gets clicked way more often than hello world. What's gonna happen is the quick insights will become aware of this being a higher priority than this. And when you next bundle your quick application, next time you run a build and deploy it, it'll use that in V, it's a really cool integration with V, where it will actually prefetch this ahead of this. So even if this is expensive, this will always download first and be immediately available. This is interactive while this is still downloading, which is also something that none of the other frameworks are capable of. Um, it's very uniquely capable of quick. Um, let's see, let me try and answer some more of these questions. Um, ah, yes, good question. Is Wiz 01 of JS2? Yes. So Wiz is 100% 01. No matter how complex your site is, it will load at the same speed because you're just loading HTML plus a finite sized bootloader that's less than a kilobyte. Um, at least in the case of Quick, it's less than a kilobyte. Wiz, I'm not sure, but I'm sure it's it's properly small. Um, but you don't get the open source and the component composition. So that's kind of like, we want the best of both worlds here, ideally. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, Bulans, uh, forgive me if my pronunciation is poor there, um, is saying, seems like it's a difference. Um, uh, it seems like this is about sort of preemptive versus postemptive execution. Wiz seems to like figure out the HTML and do it preemptively. Is that the right way to think about it? One way to think about it actually would be like eager versus lazy execution. So there's really three layers here. Um, React today, before React Server Components at least, was the worst of all these worlds. So um, the worst case scenario is, you know, you download, let's make this, let's move this out of the way. You download, download all code um, for hydration, download all like client side JavaScript code, and then you um, execute all code, and then you are interactive interactive. Now we don't want this. This is the worst case scenario, especially as your application grows larger. So this is what React used to be and still is in a lot of cases. Um, that's bad. We don't want that. What we want to do is download, and this is what Quick and Wiz do, download minimal code. Because again, you have the HTML. You don't need to download the JSX equivalent of all that HTML, especially for the HTML it's not gonna update. If you have a React client components that looks like this, but this code never updates, guess what? It's still downloading and executing and binding. It's really expensive. And HTML templates, like, that becomes a lot of JavaScript. Every single div becomes react.createElement div, comma, and all the attributes on it. That just does not ever need to go to the browser. It drives me crazy. And yes, React Server Components is a solution, but it's not automatic. With Quick, it's automatic. You can have this massive HTML, and all of that static HTML doesn't go to the browser automatically. With React, it only does if you refactor it into separate components and, and clearly identify server versus client. And if the client component has HTML and only a couple interactive things inside, guess what? You're still downloading all the HTML and executing it. Whereas with Quick, you're only downloading and executing these simple, small, interactive pieces. Um, let's go back over here. And so what we want to do is download minimal code. So a compiler like Quick can shred out, oh, in one component, here's the interactive pieces, here's the non-interactive, we're just going to throw away all the non-interactive. And then we want, to, we want to execute no code. This is the really crazy part. Now, can you download and execute no code? No, because then your website's not interactive at all. <laughs> um, so what we want is to execute no code. Because, I mean, again, think about it. You have a website, oops, okay, 
Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay. And then you are just magically interactive. And again, I showed you the man magic a moment ago. Feel free to ask questions. I can I can kind of re reelaborate some of that stuff. Um, but think about it. You have the HTML already. <laughs> it's there. You can see it. it the website is, is visible. We don't want to download anything more than the, the business logic to make the changes that need to happen upon interaction. Um, and why do we need to execute that? Like, why do we need to execute an entire component before it's even interacted with? That's ridiculous. <laughs> like, the model of the web today is ridiculous. The fact that in my code here, we're in React world. Now, again, in React world, because I have click handlers, this has to be a client component, which means before you can execute these click handlers, we had to download and execute a bunch of stuff. The whole React framework, all the code of these components, all the markup again for some reason. Like, this, this code's not even manipulating the markup. The markup never changes, but guess what? You're going to download and execute and bind all this markup for no good reason besides that's just the way that React framework was built, which was actually very innovative at the time, but it's becoming quite dated, especially when you think about more and more advanced applications that you want to run more and more faster. Um, but um, in the case of the ideal websites, we are we want to make sure the code that the the logic for interactivity is available to execute immediately when needed so there's no lag but never executes until it's interacted and the huge benefit again you get is instead of executing all the stuff including all the stuff components immediately which means things are not interactive things are slow things kind of just feel crappy uh, and things might load kind of popcorn style Ugh, it's a lot of problems bad ux bad you know across the board um, instead, when we use this more granular lazy model, if this is the only button that's clicked, this is this right here is the only code that's run. We're never running any of this other stuff. And that's kind of the important part here. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, so question here from Fallen Pentagon. I haven't used Quick. Can I call other APIs or database queries inside of my components, some of the React server components? Yes, 100%. Um, Quick has this really cool thing called tasks. Um, you can use tasks or loaders, uh, depending on your preference. Um, but yeah, we can literally go in here and say, use task and do your async goodness. Do your, um, here actually I would say use. So what's interesting here is React requires separate files for server versus not. Quick has this thing called server dollar. So anything you put in server dollar will execute server side. So with React, it's kind of magic and unknown. Like uh, you may have seen the meme about how you can run like database query in, in a, uh, a React server component prop function callback. Um, with Quick, it's actually very clear. Anything with server dollar. So here we can do something like we create like a signal. So const signal equals uh, const. Let's see, db data equals use signal. Um, and I'm going to do this. I switched out of TypeScript so I can do this the proper quick way, which means we use dollar signs. Um, dollar signs are all um, lazy loading boundaries. It's a cool concept that will spare you for another time. And then here we can do dbdata.value equals await. Um, there we go. db.query. Sure, that's fine. Oh, and let's just make this async. Await. Await. Async. Cool. But that could be anywhere. Literally, you could also make this uh, a server dollar. So maybe you want the logic for add to cart to only run server side. Cool, you can. This is actually really neat. Um, let's bump this up. Cool, save. Um, there you go. Now all that code is server side. Again, we can mix and match. We can really, um, we can really choose. Like, let me step back for a moment. One thing I hate. <laughs> the way people build frameworks is this idea that refactoring is not a problem. This idea that developers are sitting around with infinite time on their hands and in order to optimize something, you need to rewrite your component into another file, into another format, as if that's not a big deal. That is a big deal. Um, I am both a developer and the CEO of a company that pays developers. And I don't want to do refactors and I don't want to pay people to refactor code. If we decide one day that add to cart would be better off running on the server than the clients, then let's not rewrite the whole component to run on the server versus client. Let's just wrap it with server dollar. Or let's be cool, let's use worker dollar. Uh, if you've heard of Party Town, we built that too. We can just allow that to run on the worker. So now everything's really, really fast and it's very easy to control. Or do you want to run the client again? Awesome, delete. 
it's on the clients easy simple right that's how the world should be if you realize i mean this is like the rant i had before about how we built a bunch of machine learning stuff in python and then realized python was too slow and we had to rewrite it all in, in javascript and that is a huge pain huge rewrites and huge refactors are a huge pain and a huge problem for businesses and developers developers lives suck <laughs> refactoring huge swaths of code and businesses are wasting money paying you to rewrite things that are already written what we need is solutions that are much more granular, right? That's why I love that JavaScript and TypeScript are universal. Use them anywhere. You can use them for whatever you want to code for, you know, native application, server, client, web browser, Electron app, whatever you want. React Native, awesome. Native scripts. You could do anything with it. You minimize the amount of rewriting, and Quick has that philosophy as well. I just want components. I want to decide later what runs on the client or server, and all I want to do is make that decision as simple as a dollar sign. Great. It's on the client now. It's on the server now, et cetera. Um, oh, here's a good question. Why not use C++ for AI? C++ is actually great for AI because all the AI libraries are generally written in C++. They have Python bindings most of the time. They have JavaScript bindings sometime. So JavaScript can call native C code pretty easily. C++, though, you know, if you are a C++ developer, and you are comfortable with C++, that's probably the perfect tool. But the problem is when you hire a team, right? At Builder.io, we have a team of um, a dozen or so, a little over a dozen developers, and uh, the amounts that know C++ are zero. <laughs> so if you can rather uh, hire people with um, general purpose skills, like JavaScript, TypeScript, and then apply them to use AI, that's a great solution. Rust is a good solution too, but again, as soon as you go into Rust and C++, the pool of developers that could work on your product gets really small, and that's the problem for hiring. You know, if you're working in um, a startup, people usually have to work on lots of things. Today you're working on AI, tomorrow you're working on front end, the next day you're working on the native app. It's just kind of how startups go. You don't have massive teams with specialized people. You just have individuals who need to be able to jump into many areas. Um, but uh, the other interesting thing here too is, um, you know, large companies have this problem too, right? Amazon's leadership talks about how they have a revolving door problem on how they have, um, you know, developers or backend developers starting to work on the front end, et cetera, et cetera. And so, yeah, C++ is really as fast as it gets, um, you know, C, Rust, et cetera. But, you know, it's always a trade-off, right? Every engineering team, every business is always making the trade-off of, you know, code that's lightning fast, but only a small set of developers who can be, um, Arguably hard to find. Now, C++ developers are easy to find in the gaming industry, right? You work on Unreal Engine, you work on most games, you're writing C++ all day. Web developers who know C++, and AI is often hooking into web and, and native apps. That's a much smaller group. Harder to hire, harder to find, and harder to train. You take a JavaScript developer and you say, hey, work on the C++. Some things might look intuitive, and then you start being like, wait a second, <laughs> this is different. This is a very different thing. And that can be, you know, the problem there. Um, Let's see. Ah, great question. Anish asks, um, is a bachelor's degree important in general as a friend in React just developer? So you missed my rant, but I'll give you the quick recap. Um, I do not have a bachelor's degree um, in computer science. I don't have any degree of any kind. And several of the engineers on my team don't have any degree, especially not a great degree in computer science. Um, I could name several phenomenal developers who have no engineering degree. So it's not necessary to be a great developer. It is really helpful to find jobs though. And that's kind of the big important piece here. Um, oh, Matt Hutchins just signed for Enterprise with Builder. I'm looking forward to working with Builder. Amazing, I love hearing that. Let me know if there's stuff I can tell you about Builder. Um, and in fact, this is a good time to remind, hey, if you all have questions, throw them at me. I can keep talking about Quick and the performance and this and that. I can keep talking about AI. I love that people love the server dollar. Um, Let's see. Oh, so Vidal, I hope I'm saying your name okay, says Ryan Carney Auto mentioned that Quick is a really good optimization, but the solution is to remove the waterfall of lazy loading. Is that possible? I cannot see any way to do that. Um, so um, there is, let me explain this one because I think this is a, a, a common misconception. So in the case of Quick, where we're loading things as incrementally dynamically as possible, there is... Um, we want to be careful of waterfalls. Now, Quick by default solves for this by um, in, and um, by the automation of the bundling through the Quick Insights. So let me show you this. Um, 
Quick Insights is the solution to the waterfall problem. Um, the waterfall problem, for those who don't know, is this idea that, you know, let's say you have this awesome framework like Quick, where everything is independently loadable and we can just load little bits at a time. Well, let's say I am on one page and I click and I want to do client-side navigation to another page and that other page has lots of components. What you don't want them to do is load a little bit at a time because then what you can have is this loads and then this loads and then this. You want to load all at once. There's two solutions for that. One is um, server-side routing like Astro does with things like view transitions. Totally solved. Not even a concern when you use that. The second one is quick insights. Quick insights, I mentioned that in this case, it would identify that this button is used more rapidly and more often than this button. So this downloads before this, but it doesn't just handle prioritization. It also handles um, bundle grouping. And so what bundled grouping is, is that solves the waterfall problem for a client-side navigation or a significant client-side render. What that means is, let's say clicking add to cart loads the cart and the cart has a uh, cart component and a cart item component and cart you know button components. Um, without any type of bundling, each component might load piece at a time. And that would be a waterfall of request one, which fetches the other, which fetches the other, you know, down the waterfall step by step. With Quick Insights, it would actually notice that you actually, it, it will identify the waterfall and on your next build, it'll bundle those all together. And so it's really cool because generally speaking, um, when you have, um, um, frameworks, like this is one really cool thing about Quick Insights. When you have frameworks like Next.js, Vue, Nux, Svelte, etc., they only use static information available in your source code for optimizing. But the problem with that is um, there's only so much information here in the code. There's assumptions baked into the code. And the reality is we don't want to optimize for this theoretical code. We want to optimize for the end users. And so by being able to look at the end users and what they're clicking on, what they're downloading and optimize accordingly, then we can ensure we're delivering the most optimal thing, not the theoretically most optimal thing from this code. We're like, you don't know how people are going to interact with this. You don't know what they're going to click on and in what order. But if you actually have that data from your live website in a performant way, which we're able to collect it in an extremely performant way, um, now you can actually make real optimizations. And that's another step for frameworks, right? You know, it was kind of like in the earliest days you had, you know, just write HTML and then write JavaScript, right? So you write all the HTML, you write the JavaScript uh, script tags and that does the event listeners and bindings, right? Then we innovated on, actually, you're just going to write one thing. You're going to write and compose components. That was world two, and that was so nice for developer experience. You write components, you could compose them. Awesome. Um, and the way we do that is we write components and we transpile them. You know, we transpile them to plain JavaScript and we do cool, clever tricks like VDOM and stuff. Really, really cool stuff. Um, and so this is all via static compilation. As in, we're going to try to make the most simple and performant output just by looking at the code and nothing else. But the problem is your application is not the, just the code. Your application is the users. <laughs> um, you know, the application is not the static thing. It's a dynamic thing. Your users will change behaviors. They'll, they'll have, there's insights you're missing by not having any like runtime uh, code here. And that's something that, you know, is really, really unfortunate. And so what's interesting about Quick is it takes a step further and says, hey, we still want to write and compose components, but we want to use static compilation with real user insights. Oh, goodness. People in the chat are saying no compilation. <laughs> We've got some DHH fans in the chat. I very much believe in compilers. Um, as a quick aside, as a quick rant, um, there's the code you want to write and it's going to look one way and there's the code that you need to execute for best performance and it's going to look another way. If all we can do is write the code that, that runs fastest, it's not going to be the simplest to work with. That's what compilers solve. They solve the delta between what we want to write, what we want to reason about mentally and what the browser actually needs to execute and how that needs to work. And that's what we can do is we can have a system transpile or convert one to the other. That's why compilers are fantastic. Now it adds complexity, adds, adds nuance, but yeah, that's, that's the big benefit. Um, 
Let's see. There are a few questions in here, so I, I want to make sure I get some of these. Um, uh, uh, one question, HDMX. I think HDMX is really cool, but it's not something I would personally use. Um, you do need client-side interactivity, and HDMX doesn't solve it. In fact, uh, Flavio on Twitter just made a new framework thing that's like Astro plus HDMX plus Alpine. And um, I love that idea because it's like take the best of everything, Alpine for like little inline JavaScript mutation, HTMX for more significant pieces from the server, and Astro for just generating HTML on a server. Um, but it's also three mental models. It's three ways of doing stuff. They're going to get entangled. They're going to weird stuff's going to happen. You're going to have to. It's like back to the jQuery days where you have like the PHP representation, which is very declarative and nice and access to data, and the jQuery that's very not. And um, it's, ugh, it's, it's, it's too much. And HTMX really is not a full solution. You're not going to build Nike.com on HTMX. You really just won't. Um, it's cool for simple things, and it's really useful if you're already a back-end developer. You don't know front-end anyway, and you're like, hey, I just want to apply my back-end skills to the front-end. Then, hey, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good solution, actually. So for that, I would say, you know, why not? Especially if it's like a personal use case. It's something that's not going to get too complicated over time. Um, Let's see. One person struggling to choose between Next and Quick. Quick is very cool, but there are so many React-specific packages like React Aria. It's a good point. Many React packages work in Quick with the Quickify function. So I can show you what that looks like. We can literally import a React component. Let's pretend giant static components are React components. Um, we can just go here and say, hey, const giant stack component equals Quickify and um, dollar and then giant React components. And there you go. You're using React inside Quick. Now, not every library will work. In fact, React Aria is a good example of one that wouldn't because React Aria depends on very intricate hooks. It's not just a component level. It's a very hook level library. Um, so it's a good point. I would say use Quick if your use case really performance is a high priority. So if you're building Nike.com or something, Really consider looking to Quick. In fact, companies like that are exploring Quick for their key important um, parts and pages. Um, or if you actually want to learn a lot. I've never learned more personally than taking things that are libraries for another ecosystem and rebuilding my own version, either for another ecosystem or just for no other reason than just for my own learning. I've never learned more than trying to build and trying to like take the things I use and figure out how they're built. And so Quick, to me, is a very exciting way to just say, hey, even the simplest thing like a good popover or tooltip library. I realized the other day I hadn't made one of those before. And so I started looking into, like, how do you make one of these? And I'll say, look, if you're working at a large company, the large company doesn't value performance, then it's a waste of your time and their money to reinvent stuff that already exists as React libraries. But if performance does matter to you and you like the intrigue of I like being like, I don't know how this is made. Like, again, I don't have a college degree. I, I didn't study computer science. I just use stuff and I don't know how it works. And when I spend time and I just actually create that thing my own way. And in a lot of cases, what's really interesting is you figure out how the original thing works. And what I mean by that is there are many times where there's a library and you make your own version and they just work very differently, right? You implemented it one way and they implemented it another way and that's great that's fine you know theirs is probably better because they're the standard library and there's github issues and if, if there are problems with their approach people would send pull requests send issues you know complain i've made a lot of open source people will very quickly tell you what's wrong with your project and you either fix it or you know or not but if you don't you'll hear the complaints again and again and again forever probably um if it's a pressing enough uh issue um but what's really interesting is sometimes you find your solution is identical to their solution. Sometimes there's sort of this idea of like emergent patterns that there's really just a common way to solve this problem. And you solve it your way and they solve it your way and you talk to the author if you get the chance. You're like, hey, did you solve it like this? They're like, yeah, like that's the way. There's a way to solve the thing. And that's cool. It's just cool to see. I, I've talked to so many people, like somebody I think here asked how he built Builder in the drag and drop system. And I've talked to other people who built sort of like drag and drop visual editors. They kind of all work the same. They all have the same data structure. They all have the same interactivity model. Yet they were all built by people who've never built these things before. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's just a way to do these things that is kind of inherent. Um, and it's kind of cool to discover those things. These are like, to me, they're almost like scientific discoveries. Like, 
Why does gravity work? Let's test it and let's find, you know, how it is. How does drag and drop editing work? Well, let's, let's test out different approaches and then suddenly you find like, hey, there you go. This is the approach. <laughs> this is the good way to do it. And there's there's infinite bad ways and there's really only one really good way. Um, here, let me go back to the chat really quickly. Um, which drag and drop library do I prefer in front of projects? This is um, something I have a very hot take on is for the most part, there's one exception. I don't use any drag and drop libraries. I use a good reactivity system. So uh, Quick's reactivity, SolidJS's reactivity, or MobX, or Vue's reactivity, or MobX are really good examples. Um, the best reactivity system, in my opinion, is MobX state tree. If you're building a drag and drop system, I would 100% build on a MobX state tree every day of the week or month. It's very hard for me to go into the full details of why in a short manner. And you'll see it's not even the most popular project in the world. It's just a very, 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 very good reactivity system that can integrate with any framework, but works particularly well with React because React does not have good reactivity built in. And that's ironic from the name. React sounds like it's reactive. It's the least reactive. It's the most awful to use, in my opinion, regarding reactivity. Um, oh, Mr. Uh, dot is asking how state management quick. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. So let's talk about reactivity. Um, the type of reactivity I hate is immutability, shallow immutability, aka what React does. I hate it. I'll, I'll tell you the simplest example. My fiance's brother wanted to learn some front end development. And I'm like, hey, let me teach you some React, right? He was like a second year in computer science at school. Obviously not learning JavaScript, learning, you know, Java, uh, you know, backend stuff like they teach you in a computer science degree, or at least at that time they did. This was maybe five years ago, something like that. Um, and I started to explain React. And I started to be like, oh, okay. So if we're gonna talk React state, we need to understand mutability versus immutability. And I was like, Whew, okay, this is, there's a lot of, lot to unpack here <laughs> for a beginner developer to just know how to make a basic thing. Um, and then I started kind of trying to describe it and I was like, you know what? Let's try something else. Let's just try Vue. <laughs> and then I remember showing a Vue and I was like, Vue just makes sense. <laughs> if you want to update user.name, you just say user.name equals Steve. And that's it. It's done. <laughs> you did it. You don't have to find like the top level reference for user and do user spread. You know, you don't have to, got to do this crap. You know, this whole idea of like function update user. We need to know where the root user is. And we have to say user equals, you know, uh, uh, user name, you know, Steve. And then, oh, what if it's nested? Or like, what if we accidentally mutate it? Uh, you know, it'll work, but the function won't, the component won't update. And it's like, oh, why? Ugh. Ah. And then what if your user reference isn't here? It's like, it's up above you. Then you have to do some kind of callback. Like you have to pass a callback down, you know, update user. And then you're trying to do like update user with, oh, update user, pass the user. Ah, ah, you know, kill me. This is too complicated. Like, why is this so complicated? <laughs> the best reactivity system is just this. Uh, you want username to change? Username equals changed. It's done. It's fine. We're good, <laughs> right? Um, this is how views reactivity works. This is how Quick's reactivity works. So I'll show you. Um, in Quick, we can say like const user equals uh, use store name Steve. Great. Then you want to update it later. User.name equals Bob. And if you listen to the username here, Whenever it changes, it'll update in your code. That's the easy reactivity. That's what you get with um, Quick, Vue, SolidJS, not React. And let's use MobX. MobX with React will give you that. Now, there is more nuance here, of course. Uh, and thanks for the congrats on my engagement, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I recently got engaged. Um, I have some funny photos. Maybe I can dig those up. Um, but anyway, um, in fact... <laughs> I kind of want to take a brief tangent. Hold on. Let's see if I can. Oh, I'm not logged into Instagram. Never mind. I have some funny uh, photos of me and my dog on Instagram that we took as part of our engagement, but I'll, I'll share those another time. They're on Twitter and stuff. Um, and yeah, Vidal says I hate Emmer.js for this reason. Exactly. Emmer.js tries to give the benefits of mutability while maintaining the benefits of immutability, but it's not quite there. Mobic State Tree solves this. So the only two issues you might have with this 
is one, you might be afraid of allowing freeform edits, right? So if you talk to um, David K. Piano, um, or David Korshid <laughs> as his real name, um, he would say, for very good reason, that this is bad, this is dangerous. You shouldn't just mutate this thing. You should have controls. You should have something like user.setName. Um, and then you can provide this. And then in the setName function, you can have um, different guards and checks and, and validations and stuff like that. It's a good point. Now, there are frameworks that support interesting things here, though. So if you use Mavic State Tree, you can use what's called an interceptor to intercept a change and decide if it's allowed, valid, or not, and stuff like that. With Mavic State Tree, you can also guard, as in you can make it so that this is not possible and you have to use the set name function and, and do whatever. Um, so there are options here. That's one thing to, to keep in mind and be aware of. Now, let's see. Um, he's doing it. Okay, let's go to some of the other comments. Um, talking about jobs, I'm oof. Four components. Um, oh yeah, this is a good question. Hun asks, is there any reason that Quick doesn't have control flow components? So control flow components, um, if I understand the question correctly, would be like what SolidJS has, where you have something like, you know, let's say this button is is conditional. Let's say this button is something like, you know, um, there are products in the cart. That's a bad name, but you get the idea. Um, in React world, you do this admittedly pretty ugly stuff where you, um, you know, you can use Boolean expressions or ternaries or other stuff to, to decide or, or to control control flow here. What SolidJS does, that's really cool, is they have control flow components. So you can say show when there are products in the cart. And then we can put that here, paste that there. Oops, paste. Oh my goodness. I don't know how to use computers. Let's just type this. And sorry. Uh, oh my goodness, I don't have it. There we go. Okay, sorry. New computer for those who are new here. I just switched to Windows purely for streaming. Long story, and I don't know how to. <laughs> I don't know all the keyboard shortcuts. My key muscle memory, my finger muscle memory is all messed up. Um, but anyway, uh, this is cool. This is more elegant looking, in my opinion. It's a little bit more like Vue and Svelte and other nice frameworks. Um, Quick doesn't have those built in because it doesn't need them. So SolidJS needs these for best possible performance to do granular updates. Quick under the hood um, automatically will do granular updates without these, with the exception of loops and iterations, where it actually falls back to VDOM, like a granular VDOM, um, because actually that's kind of, as weird as it sounds, it's quite fast and it's a really good cushion. By cushion, I mean SolidJS, if you do if you like replace a reference, like you have an array and you create a new array, you're gonna bail out of a lot of, you, you actually could end up with very bad performance very quickly. You have to be very meticulously aware of your references and how you mutate um, as opposed to replace references. With VDOM, you don't worry about it, who cares? You mutate, you, you replace, you swap, you slice, it's always fast. That's what Quick chooses to do and I think it's a pretty smart choice. So there's no need for control flow though you could make them. Um, in fact, I actually did this once. I made, in a React app, I made control flow components for React just to make my code more clean. They're very simple to implement. I actually might be able to find these. Um, oh, I won't have this code downloaded. Uh, I might be able to find, hold on. I, might be, I, I feel like uh, in our HTML, uh, what is it? HTML, Figma, Figma HTML. It's one of these. There we go, Figma HTML. Um, I think, is it in here? No, it might be a different repo. I did this. Maybe it was mitosis? I forget. One of these repos, I wrote some control flow components for React, and they're like two lines of code each. They're so simple. <laughs> it's really, really simple. We can actually write this right now. And you could do the same in quick. So you're literally just going to say const show equals uh, uh, win. And we can, do, uh, we can do this in TypeScript as well. And you say win is Boolean. Uh, that's it. And that's all. You're done. Oh, this is JSX. Uh, so anyway, that's what TypeScript would look like. That's it. We made a control flow component. Um, we're done. So there's no reason you can't do that in Quick or anything else, which is pretty cool. Um, you did get an Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anish is asking again about drag and drop. So 
I did mention I don't use drag and drop. Instead, I use a good reactivity system. And then um, with a good reactivity system, drag and drop gets really easy. Because, um, and I made a separate video about this. And I do have to run here pretty shortly. Um, apologies in advance. But I made a, a video somewhere about this. But with good reactivity, what you can do is you can actually, let's take this as an example. We can say, um, let's make a drag drop component. And I'll show you one library that I do use. Um, there's one use case that I use a library for. Okay, so let's do something really simple. Const um, state equals use store. And I'm gonna just say mouse x is zero, mouse y is zero. So I'm just making a generic state object and I'm tracking some stuff. Now in quick, we have this thing called use visible task, which is much like use effects. And all we're gonna do Oh, actually, we're going to use do this. We're going to use uh, on window uh, mouse move. Very simple. And then events. That's it. We're just going to track automatically. Whenever your mouse moves, we're going to set the current cursor X and Y on mouse X, mouse Y. Now, check this out. We can literally just say, let's say this is our draggable object. Um, we're just going to say div, and we're going to say style equals top state down mass y, left state down mass x, position fixed. Wow. Now, this will follow my cursor. Wherever my cursor goes, this div is going to follow. Now, you can add your own logic to say, like, you know, if is dragging. Um, right, these styles we only want if we're dragging, so we can have, like, an is dragging. False. And we can do like, you know, state dot is dragging. And there you go. That's it. And we can say like on click. On click equals state dot is dragging equals true. Ta-da, drag and drop. Done. Um, now obviously there's a little nuance to that, but it's surprisingly simple when you use a good reactivity system like this. You just declare your state, you update it, you declare how it attaches to things as you move it around, and you're done. And that's exactly how, let's go to Builder again, and let's say we're taking, um, you know, like we have this logic for like, I grab a text block and I drag it around. See how this is following my cursor? See how I can drag in different places? That's all. That's how it works. Now the one place I do recommend um, using a drag and drop library is this one. Let's actually close a bunch of windows. Um, this one by Airbnb is really good. And I think it's like partially deprecated or something. React beautiful DB. Anytime you have rearrangeable lists, they did a really good job with this library. So if you just want to have stuff you can drag and rearrange, React Beautiful Tree and D&D all the day. In Builder, it's the only drag and drop library we use. We use for a few things that you just reorder. So we don't do that for um, the actual drag and drop canvas, but there's certain areas where we render lists, lists that want to be that we want to reorder. React Beautiful D&D does a great job. Good animations, good good um, space compensation, meaning when I when I drag this, it actually removes it from the DOM, but it does not remove the space until I've actually pulled this out of the container entirely. Lots of good nuance there, which is really good. Um, oh, good question. Are these live streams saved anywhere? Um, currently, no. <laughs> I might start saving them, maybe to YouTube. That might be a good place. Um, Obviously, check out my subscribe to me or follow me on the different channels, and, and you can see, um, you know, I'll put out kind of short form content or, or sometimes medium, not usually long, on some of this stuff. Um, another question What state management are you using? Zustand or Renux? We use Mavic State Tree. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but it's, it's fantastic. Or with Quick, you just use the built in Quick U stores. Um, and yeah, Patrick is saying, did they deprecate this? I swear they did, or they did some kind of like, yeah, they're not maintaining it. I'll be honest, I've used the thing forever, and I've never needed anything more out of it. So I actually really respect that they did this. I swear I've made a few repos where I still get issues on sometimes, and I'm like, it's, I, I just, I know the thing works. <laughs> you know, you may not get more out of it, but it does work. And I think that's what the state of this is. It works. Airbnb, for those of you who don't know, um, when COVID hit, their business got smashed. I mean, their revenue just tanked because people weren't traveling. And so they had to cut and lay off, do all this stuff. So I'd imagine when that happened, they're like, oh goodness, we don't have resources to put into libraries like this anymore. But that thing just works. There's probably alternatives. There might be more popular ones. I do think they really nailed the subtle details here. 
um, better than any other library I've ever seen or used. So use it at your own risk, but I've never regretted it. I've never needed, I've never needed to create a GitHub issue for this library ever. We're probably in builder.io on a much older version than the latest and never cared, never bothered to update, et cetera. You might not ever need to. Oh, cool. React Beautiful. There's a fork called React Beautiful. Awesome. Um, React Beautiful GitHub. Let's see. Where is it? Well, somebody's got a fork somewhere. Um, good to know. <laughs> Patrick's saying the Angular community is using his HMR package. He hasn't updated in five plus years. Yes, that totally happens. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. Like, sometimes... Some projects gotta get updated all the time, some just don't, and like that's fine. And it just depends on if, if you need it or not. In my experience, you don't need it in this case, but other cases maybe. Um, yeah, we could create our own fork. Never even needed to. I have forked a whole bunch of other stuff though. Um, my favorite thing, I mean, I'll tell you one thing. If you wanna avoid forks, patch package. My favorite. This is less necessary than it used to be in the good old days, but um, this is a cool, cool project where if you're like, hey, I'm using a node module. I just need a tiny change. I know where it needs to be changed. This is a very simple solution to that where you can actually monkey patch your node modules as needed um, without maintaining forks. I used to maintain forks for every change I needed and wait for the pull request and stuff. Then we started using patch package. Recently, we actually removed pa patch package from the build repo entirely, I'm pretty sure. Um, there is, uh, yeah, Patrick probably remembers. Back in the day, there are some jacked up node modules you'd have that just need little one-liner updates since this was the tool. These days, I think the, the NPM community uh, has improved and it no longer says needed. Okay, I need to sign off here in one minute, but I'll answer one more question before I do. Um, I don't know if I have the perfect answer for this, but let me just give some thoughts. So I've been asked a few times, any thoughts on getting a job in this job market? And the reality is it is very difficult. I remember when the economy first started to take a noticeable change, uh, at least in the United States, and um, our VP of sales said, who's been through a couple of these uh, in, in tech businesses um, when there were economic down swings, um, he basically said that um, during these times of um, a down economy, we just got to work harder to make less money. <laughs> and it was a very pessimistic but very, very accurate thing to say. And that's the reality here. The job market's gonna be harder. You're gonna be offered less money. You're gonna have to apply to more places. But, you know, there's a saying that goes along the lines of like, um, tough times make tough people and like soft times make soft people, something like that. Um, and, you know, even we're a young startup. We only have 50 something people and the economy hit us as well. And like, you know, in some ways you're in a nimble position because you're small. And in some ways you're in a very exposed position um, because you're small. You don't have this big historical revenue. And, you know, if you have to cut expenses, there's not a lot of places there to find it. And so, um, you know, I, I think the funny thing here is um, uh, have lower expectations than usual. Um, definitely you know, work as hard as possible to have the most relevant experience possible. You know, when we are hiring, I will say a lot of times we're looking for people who have rinse and repeat experience, meaning they've already worked on the types of problems that we work on and we see them as someone who could just jump in and start contributing immediately. Um, so in the case of, you know, how do I, you know, get myself, I land a job that, you know, is, is something that somebody would want to hire me for, right? The easiest thing is, oh, super senior developer who's already done all the things at all the big companies, right? That's an obvious one. But if you're newer in your career, you know, I think the closest shortcut to that is making your own personal projects or contributing to open source. I will say one thing. When you do work that's public, as in, you know, someone applies to a job with us and I see that, um, they built some open source thing or they built something that I can see proof of their work, like it's open source or something. Um, and, um, and it's the type of work that I know would be a good fit for what we need. That's much easier than like, you know, a resume that is, maybe it doesn't stand out, right? Maybe you don't have the years of experience. So working on open source, building interesting projects, 
you know, when people apply and they have in their resume links to stuff they've made, and I'm impressed by the things they've made, I think the uh, one example I saw was uh, Daniel applied to us, and he had this personal website that was just awesome. It was just very, very awesome. Like, it was, it was crazy. Um, I've seen some people do some things like this. Let me find it. Daniel X more. Let me see if I can find you this. This, this really, really impressed me. Uh, whimsy.space, I think that's it. Whimsy.space. There it is. <laughs> so several things. And this is an experienced developer. Let's say you're not an experienced developer. But look at this. This is crazy. This is a full-on sort of OS. This is all made from scratch here. He's got all these different things. I think, oh man, this is so funny. You can actually open up the CSS for this thing and make changes. Let's see. So maybe we can change the background color to white. And then can I save? There we go. <laughs> this is crazy. It's a really crazy thing. But like, I'm not even scratching the surface here. We can actually go in. And uh, it shows personality too. This guy's not a designer. Um, but, you know, it definitely has a cool vibe. You know, Windows 95 style, but a little bit different. And he has all these different things that he's made here. Code it. Okay, so code editor, I guess we already saw. And... Um, uh, let's see. There was some interesting stuff here. I think Pixie Paint is a really cool one. Oh, wait, no. This is different than I thought. But hey, it's a paint program, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he made a paint program. Like, this thing is elaborate. This thing shows skills across the board. And it's not what every employer is optimizing for. Is, is Google looking for a Stanford degree and 10 years experience or a cool drawing pad? They're looking for the first one. But startups, smaller businesses, medium business, stuff like that, um... He has something else really cool in here. What is it? And maybe it's not linked to in here. Oh, it's a game, I think. Maybe. This is a wild. He has a lot of stuff in here. Oh, he's got like his blog post in here. Do you dab? Oh, what? <laughs> anyway, it's a cool site. It actually has a lot of interesting stuff. Oh, DanielX.net. Here we go. Here's his other stuff. Oh, here's also a web browser inside of this. Now it's just an iframe, but again, it's clever. It shows this guy knows how to code in very clever ways. He's got these blog posts writing. Blogging is another one I'd recommend too, by the way. Make cool stuff and then write about it. Show people what you made. Open source the code when you can. Write a blog post describing it. In my opinion, if you don't have the most experience, but you show you can build amazing stuff, you can speak to it articulately, and I can even go in and see the code, and the code looks all right. It doesn't have to look perfect, but as long as it looks all right, that I think will help you stand out compared to other candidates, especially if you don't have the resume already to, to back it up. Showing you have passion, showing you can build amazing things, really, in my experience, goes a long way. When we're looking at hiring people, and we see this, we think, hey, um, this could actually maybe be somebody who can build some great stuff for us. Okay, I'm opening up one thing. Somebody asked me to look at JS only, advanced web components framework based on vanilla JS, SQLite, and VJS. Sounds cool. I don't love web components, um, but it's interesting. And so I appreciate um, Profs. <laughs> it's a Profs AI or Profs Al. I think AI sharing that. Um, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. And one other question that came up how does Builder make money? Um, really, it's just if you're using the platform and you're using it in non trivial ways, We'll charge you on how many seats are inside Builder. So if you have your whole team inside Builder, you'll pay like per, per individual, like you know GitHub or something like that. And then if you're using Builder to power like parts of your website using our APIs, you'll pay for the API volume, kind of like AWS pricing. Okay, everybody. Um, I need to run. I appreciate you all. I've been here for two hours and 40 minutes now. <laughs> I appreciate you all tuning in. This was really, really fun. Um, I enjoyed streaming to a bunch of different platforms. It looks like I'm getting the most people on YouTube followed by X, followed by TikTok, roughly. Um, this has been a blast, though. I appreciate all the comments. I'm going to start trying to make streaming a more regular thing, so I don't have a fixed schedule yet, um, but I intend to be back. So thank you all for joining, and I will catch you all next time. Keep your ears out for when I pop on again. See y'all. Let me figure out how I end the